in 30 seconds. Please find your seats. Please find your seats. This is a hybrid event. This is both online and in person. And we have an equal number of folks watching online at this moment. And we're going to start on time. Can you just do it? I'm not All right. We're going to get started. Are we ready now? We're online. So the mics are hot. The cameras are online right now live. And welcome to the fifth annual Northport Commercial Real Estate Summit. It's presented by the Northport Development Division. And at this time, I'd like to recognize the dignitaries that we have in our presence here in person. And we have Mayor Jill Luke. Please rise and be recognized. Let's give a slip of hand. Vice Mayor Pete Emmerich. Thank you. Commissioner Debbie McDowell. Thank you. Commissioner Barbara Langdon. Commissioner Alice White. Interim City Manager Jason Yarborough, <laughs> Acting Assistant Manager Julie Balea, thank you. <laughs> thank you for this, Julie. Thank, thank you very much. And Northport Fire Chief Scott Titus, thank you. And Jean Matthews, former Sarasota County. Hey, Jean. Good to see you. Thank you so much. In terms of welcoming announcements, we need to share that we have some informational information. The summit is recorded. It will be available on YouTube. So it's available for posterity and, and to watch and share with your clients as stakeholders. We also have the availability to send questions online real time to economic development at cityofnorthport.com. And Caitlin from the Office of Economic Development will be fielding those questions. We will try to get to as many as we can. The recording will be available on the City of Northport's YouTube channel. Restrooms for those of you who are in person. We have about an equal amount of folks in person as we do online. So welcome to our online guests. The restrooms, for those of you who are here, are to the right. There will be a five minute break at around 10.15 or so, five minute break. So what it th we'd like to do is get started with our program. Hopefully all of you have received your program, which has a wealth of information. And for those of you online, I'm sure this is also available to you online. We're going to get started by honoring our veterans. For those of you who are online, thank you for your service. If you are a veteran and you are here in person, would you please stand and be recognized? And let's give our veterans a hand for their service. <laughs> and at this time, we'd like to invite our Vice Mayor Pete Emmerich to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and you may be seated. At this time, I would like to invite Jill, Mayor Jill Luke, to the podium and she's going to have some opening remarks for us. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Jill Luke. It's kind of bizarre, I'm not used to being at this podium. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, I am Jill Luke. I'm the mayor of the city of Northport. And on behalf of the city, I do welcome you all, whether you're in person or whether you're online. I'm excited about the summit today, and I'm doubly excited about the direction that our city is going into, and I'm grateful for you and the part that you play in it currently or that you will be playing in it in the future. 
Our young city is preparing for the next stage of growth. Our city staff and our commission are committed to working with you, doing what it takes to make your dreams, your visions come true. Because, when, because your dreams are our dreams. And when you succeed, we succeed as a city. It's a collaboration that knits together like a family, that builds and binds the, our community and molds it into a city that is healthy and provides a quality of life. The city of Northport is willing to learn, to adjust, to work hard, and not stop. I invite you to consider being part of the force that will forge the future for this young community. Thank you for attending, and I hope by the end of this summit, you're as excited as I am. <laughs> well said. What a great way to start our meeting today and our fifth annual event. Awesome. It's very exciting. And now we're going to transition into a hybrid presentation. And as an MC for over 20 years, this is the first for me with hybrid. Our next presenter is Brian Bailey. Brian Bailey is no stranger to Northport no stranger to Southwest Florida, and no st stranger actually to the entire nation. He's a well-respected expert, subject matter expert for the Federal Reserve in Atlanta, and he is uh, excited to be presenting an overview of what's going on in the commercial real estate sector. So Brian should be online, and I'm sure the technology is going to work perfectly. Hi, Brian, good morning. Good morning, Marianne. Hopefully you can hear me all right. It's perfect. Thank you. And thank you so much for your willingness to speak to us all the way from Atlanta regarding what's Excellent. going on with commercial real estate. Thank you, Brian. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. And Mayor Luke, honored dignitaries, ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate the opportunity to come share a few thoughts. Hopefully uh, these thoughts will help your community as it's growing as a commercial real estate professional for many years in the private sector before coming to the Fed. I appreciate the need and dynamic that commercial real estate plays in the growth and health of a community. So my thought is, uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful that some of my thoughts will uh, provide some insight today and help you as you make some of those challenging decisions going forward. I must also thank Mary Ann Mize uh, and the Northport, uh, City of Northport's economic development team uh, for uh, the warm introduction, the hospitality, and all of the kind assistance as we work through uh, some of the technology challenges. Let me start really quick, uh, just to be clear. These are my thoughts and not necessarily those of my esteemed colleagues at the Atlanta Fed of the board, the Federal Reserve System, nor the Board of Governors. Talk a little bit today about a light at the end of the tunnel. Certainly we have come through a very, very challenging period. I will shed some perspective on that, some context, but certainly we're seeing the reopenings and some of the accelerated growth dynamics as, as certainly a very positive for the economy. Certainly there are potential headwinds that could reemerge if we have a reemergence of the virus or some other unanticipated dynamic, but certainly right now for 2021, it looks like that we're in somewhat of a, of a sweet spot uh, moving forward. To give you a little bit of context on what we have on the screen here, this is the change in non-farm employment, so private sector employment. And you can see that prior to the pandemic, um, and then the pandemic hits, and all of a sudden the economy loses roughly 22 million jobs in the span of 60 days. To put that in context, we can look back to the Great Recession of 2009 when times were very dire. I actually lived in Florida at the time, so I uh, was front and center for you know, the challenges with the economy and real estate. And in 2009, the economy lost roughly 10 million jobs in that downturn. 
and it did so over about 18 months, give or take. In this instance, the economy shed at least double the amount of jobs and did it in just a fraction of the time. So certainly, uh, you know, very dire, uh, very rapid slowdown and, and very significant decline in employment. At the same point, once the support that came from the federal government, from the Federal Reserve, from you know, the state and local government began to enter the picture, you saw a resurgence in the number of jobs. And we have created a, a strong, consistent amount, except for December, we've, cons we've, we've created a consistent number of jobs. But certainly, one of the areas that I know is near and dear to Florida's heart and certainly has a, an impact for Northport's economy are leisure and hospitality. We look, uh, we've lost, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, we had over seven and a half million workers in leisure and hospitality displaced. Since then, leisure and hospitality has grown in fits and starts. The good news is in 2021, we have seen a consistent resurgence in, in that area, but we continue to remain about 2 million jobs short of the seven and a half that we that we lost. So we've put back about five and a half million of those jobs. So we still have a to go. On the, the next slide, let's just put context around the dynamic of unemployment. And we can see U3, which is the most widely quoted number in the press. However, you are considered employed if you work an hour. Um, you are not counted if you have given up. So a little bit of, of, of selectiveness in that number. And, and you can see that after hitting 15%, which was 50% more than the peak of 2009, we've seen that number steadily decline to today. It's about 6.1%. U3, fascinatingly enough, went from a 50-year low prior to the pandemic to a 70-year high in the span of two months. So certainly you can see that whiplash effect in, in that respect there. U6, which is a broader definition of unemployment, it counts people who want a full-time job but have part-time jobs. It counts people who have given up. And you can see that after hitting roughly 22, 23% during the pandemic, which compared to 2010, uh, when it peaked at 17%, certainly, you know, 25% greater, you see it's come down to 10, 10%. So certainly that has improved. But one of the things that we know out of the pandemic is that lower skilled workers have taken the brunt of the displacements. And what we saw out of the downturn in 2009 and the corresponding expansion is that it took that segment of workers a longer period of time to come back into the workforce. On the next slide, we see weekly, weekly jobless claims. Certainly the number is improving markedly, but to put it in context, prior to the pandemic, the 52 week average was 216,000. Today, the most recent results are about 440, 40, 444,000, pardon me. So essentially double. Uh, we're double today where we were pre-pandemic. That number has declined as we have more support that's entered the economy, but certainly we've got a ways to go, and that does create a, a headwind for not only local economies, but the commercial real estate segment in those economies. On the next slide, we've broken out a little bit of kind of that decline in employment by skill group. And so you can see that we've uh, high skilled jobs, management, professional technical jobs. We've defined middle skill as sales and office construction, production, transportation jobs, and, and lower skilled jobs, primarily service jobs. You can see that because of the shelter in place mandates, because of some of the of variants uh, in, in the responses, we had a very significant pullback. We had upwards of 30% job losses in areas like hospitality and leisure. It's begun to come back, 
but certainly we're still roughly about 10% below those pre-pandemic peaks. Certainly there are lots of questions about, you know, the enhanced benefits, uh, the enhanced unemployment insurance benefits, maybe keeping some folks on the sidelines. But in addition, I think that there are a number of other areas that are impacting uh, workers and their ability to come back to work. One of them, I would think, is the ability to find safe and satisfactory child care. Uh, we've heard that in a number of instances uh, as far as a limitation to come back to work. On the next slide, talking about Florida employment, unemployment real quick. This is as of March. Certainly, you know, good news for Southwest Florida as those counties are on the lower end of the, of the scale, whereas some of the other counties, particularly Central Florida, stands out as having heightened employments because of their concentration in uh, leisure and hospitality workers. And then transitioning to home price appreciation, you know, what we see is, you know, a replica of the dynamics that are going on around the nation, prime, you know, partially driven by the vast in-migration to Florida. Uh, Florida is, is, you know, one of the primary drivers of, of uh, recipients of migration right now. So certainly good news, but driving up uh, home price appreciation. So in-migration combined with, um, low cost of debt, uh, with uh, eviction moratoriums, uh, those kind of dynamics are all factoring into greater home price appreciation. Certainly, um, materials costs are also factoring into that, but that seems to be, in my view, a little bit more transitory, and hopefully I'll have a few minutes to talk about that at the end of, of the presentation. Talking about migration really quick, uh, these are, these are, uh, this is a, a schematic put together by United Van Lines. Um, they're rating the number of inbound moves as a percentage. Um, they only have Florida at number nine. I'm sorry. Uh, I think that the Census Bureau, uh, you know, has it much higher than that, uh, certainly within the top two uh, as far as in-migration is concerned. So we know that in-migration is certainly having a very significant impact on the dynamics of commercial real estate across the Southeast and Florida certainly is benefiting. As you have more population, Certainly, there is the need for more commercial real estate in a in a balanced perspective, and I think that we have to be you know careful about uh, real estate because you know in essence uh, we've seen some cities that have you know targeted uh, a couple of you know very uh, specific areas, tourism, etc., um, and and that works well for a period of time, but certainly the economy can change. And as we saw in 2001, uh, having a very, very significant concentration of your economy for uh, hospitality uh, certainly, you know, created some some pretty uh, pretty significant stress for areas like Orlando. Um, so on this slide that's being shown, this represents, in my view, kind of a forward indicator for commercial real estate. Uh, Chair Powell talked at the FOMC briefing in March about reaching a point of inflection. Here's another piece of data that substantiates that. And basically, this comes from the Architectural Institute, uh, and it takes information, a survey, um, as far as economic activity uh, related to architecture. And so you can see that pre-pandemic, uh, any result above 50 is an expansion. And so we had, you know, positive number of inquiries, a positive number of design contracts. Those, that activity was expanding. Billings, which is in shading, was continuing to expand. And then the pandemic hit. And like most other industries, we saw the level of activity drop off and decline very markedly. So inquiries, design contracts, and total billings all dropped off very significantly. And for several months, it was that way. And then we began to see kind of fall 2020, we began to see a resurgence in the number of inquiries so that, you know, and consistently at the end of the year, it began to go above 50. 
uh, which means an indication of expansion. But really, what we really have seen is design contracts and billings turn the corner as of February of 2021. And so my view, that's a good sign because we know that planning, that dollars going into planning are important and lead the way for new construction projects. So it appears that we're beginning to turn the corner on that respect. So I think some good news on that front. Talking about commercial real estate, obviously Florida benefits from this wave of population growth. In respect, Florida's population growth is two, three, and in some instances locally three times what the national national population growth is. Uh, so that is a very strong dynamic in that respect. And that should and will lead to the need for more residential and commercial real estate. At the same point, we know that costs uh, have begun to weigh on the minds of developers. And so from, from that instance, we know that there's a little bit of a headwind as some developers as recently as yesterday uh, gave me an earful about their, you know, their issue about having tenants, but because construction costs have gone up so much, they're having to delay the start of projects. Uh, so that's a, you know, a little bit of a, a, a dark cloud on the horizon and we need to continue to watch. But certainly my view is that that is temporary, that those cost increases are temporary. Uh, another area we have to be concerned about as far as Florida is concerned is the rapid growth in property insurance premiums. Uh, that is growing, as many of you know, and probably know better than I do. Uh, those numbers are, are growing at, at, at double digits if you can get insurance uh, and have been for, for a few years. And that's that's concerning uh, because, you know, it, it can lead to an erosion of the personal financial balance sheet, but it can also lead to greater pressure on commercial real estate, uh, net operating income dynamics. Hospitality, uh, some some good news. And I think that uh, Southwest Florida benefits directly from this, but certainly there are. Uh, a greater number of non-work related domestic travelers that are uh, utilizing hotels. Um, I will be one of them in a couple of weeks down in, down in your area as I take the, the family for the annual beach vacation. Um, so I think that we're beginning to see a little bit of a shift in sediment uh, around feeling more comfortable uh, returning to areas where people gather. At the same point, conferences group foreign travel uh, you know, will continue to remain at muted levels for uh, a good part of this year. And, and full service hotels, which live off of the business traveler, will continue to face headwinds. So a little bit of a mixed bag uh, for hospitality. Retail, e-commerce sales continue to grow. It's created some headwinds. Uh, for traditional retailers. I think in some areas we can see e-commerce uh, try to break the mold and go into areas that they have not had a significant uh, area, a significant amount of penetration. And so that will be an area to continue to watch as you're looking at um, you know, what commercial real estate means for your community. Restaurant closures due to the pandemic have created very significant headwinds. We're still roughly 2 million jobs short in hospitality um, and, and certainly some questions in my view around the long-term scarring effects on some of the restaurants, which we know are very significant drivers employment for lower skilled workers. So how long will those scar, how, how bad is the scarring? What's the degree of the scarring? And how long will it take businesses to overcome that as we see reopenings? Office, you know, the office of the future uh, is, is here with us. Um, I was in a conference yesterday discussing that, uh, and, and the big takeaway was nobody knows. Uh, we are figuring it out as we go. Now, some of the things we do know is that individuals and businesses are moving away from higher cost markets, and that certainly is beneficial for, for the city of Northport. Uh, also, you know, pandemic-related trends, um, we know that the pandemic accelerated remote work, work from home, et cetera. 
but really what it did is accelerated data that we've seen in the census data for the last 10 years. Multifamily continues to uh, remain pretty strong. Uh, there were some uh, foreclosures. Uh, well, pardon me, let me, let me back up. So multifamily remains strong. We've seen that dynamic accelerate uh, in some of the areas that were harder hit at the beginning of, uh, you know, in, in the pandemic, they began to accelerate uh, in January. So certainly some good news there. Areas that are B and C product, uh, class product, remain functionally full, 95, 96%. And, and really we're not building that product and really that leads into a significant national shortage of affordable workforce housing. And so, you know, that is an area that um, if your city and area are able to address, uh, certainly would be beneficial and, and, and really probably in my mind would create somewhat of a competitive advantage having some cohort, some group of that segment able to live in your community because we look at uh, you know a number of areas and it is just unaffordable for some of the uh, you know m low and moderate uh, income classes. So certainly there we know also that um, you know Fannie and Freddie, Mac, which have been very, uh, who are very influential in the financing, multifamily financing arena, uh, are pivoting toward more affordable product, which should allow banks and, and non-bank lenders more opportunities in the in the space. So, talking about hotels, um, I want to just talk about a little bit on the next slide, as far as giving context, as far as the percent change in the number of hospitality and small businesses that are open compared to 2020. And my apologies that this may be a little bit hard to read for some of you, but, but you can see in, in Florida that we had in February on the left, you know, we had over 50% of the leisure and hospitality small businesses closed compared to the pandemic. Now, transition to April on the right, and that number has de decreased. And so from, from that standpoint, we are seeing, you know, a, thank you, the resurgence, you know, the, the improvement in sediment that is corresponding to a greater percentage of the population that's, that's vaccinated. So certainly some good dynamics there. But at the same point, I'd, I'd leave you, uh, I saw a survey done uh, by one of the uh, trade organizations that represents uh, restaurants uh, and they said in December that they thought that there were over 120,000 restaurants national, nationally that had permanently closed. And that, you know, as of December, so certainly we still had January and February in my mind, uh, you know, where some of the economic dynamics were not great. And so from, from that standpoint, uh, you know, we need to continue to watch, you know, how many, how many restaurants uh, reopen because they are a vital uh, cog in the national economy and local economy as far as employing lower skilled workers. On the, on the next slide, please, this represents occupancy as far as hotels are concerned, and we've broken it out uh, by in red, those hotels that have the percentage of hotels that have less than 30% occupancy, in yellow, those that have basically 30 to 60% occupancy, and those in green that have more than 60% occupancy. And the thing that jumps out to me is you can easily, uh, you know, kind of contrast March 7th of 2020 on the far left versus May 8th, the week of May 8th. 2021 on the far right, and you can see that essentially the number of hotels that were occupied 60% or greater is getting close to returning to pre-pandemic levels. And again, I think it is that lower segment, you know, those Marriott courtyards, the residents in, uh, the Fairfield Inn, et cetera, those hotels which are seeing, you know, this resurgence and not necessarily the higher end full service uh, hotels. But I think that it will be some time before we see uh, some of that, the, the dynamics in the full service space uh, return, uh, return to pre-pandemic levels. On, on the next slide, just talking about retail really quick. Uh, we have come out.
kind of a period where we've seen many, many closed uh, signs saying we're closed. Now we're seeing the other end of the spectrum where more folks are reopening. There is a thirst for uh, labor right now in those lower skilled segments. And so certainly some very good news. But on this slide, you can see the change in retail sales. We've broken it out in e-commerce in orange and in blue represents establishments, the traditional bricks and mortar establishments. And, and you can see essentially, you know, what we all know is that when the shelter in place uh, associated with the pandemic came out, we all went home and we got on our computer and we began to buy things. And so growth in the e-commerce space accelerated uh, after years of double digit growth around 10%, uh, which we thought, wow, I'm not sure how much better it can get. It does get better and it goes to 30%. At the same point, traditional bricks and mortar retailers, you know, had some very dire uh, results as far as sales are concerned associated with the shelter in place in the early parts of the pandemic. But we've seen some of them that have been able to change their business model a little bit. We've seen some of them that are reopening. Um, and, and so certainly from that standpoint, that is good news. And we're beginning to see more folks reemerge and begin to buy things at the traditional bricks and mortar hotel, uh, bricks and mortar retail. On, on the next slide here, I, I, can, I can have a little bit of latitude with humor. And so I will reference the old Wendy's commercial from uh, the mid or early 1980s. Where's the beef? Uh, unfortunately, you know, in the restaurant area we talked about, we've had a, a very significant number of restaurants close. Um, and, and so from, you know, that standpoint, again, back to that uh, very challenging dynamics uh, on, on that front. Uh, but certainly in April on the right, you can see kind of an improvement on, on that front, which is good news and, and certainly looking forward to more of that. If we talk a little bit transitioning to an area that we know has been challenging, uh, malls. Um, certainly this represents the percentage of malls that have vacancy less than 10% in green, 10 to 20% in yellow, 30 20 to 30% in orange, and greater than 30% in red. And, and what we know is, is in certain circles, the pandemic, COVID has been uh, labeled as the great accelerator. And so we have seen the number of malls that have higher vacancies, again, above 30%, grow and grow very substantially. And certainly in that respect, I think that a number of communities have ha, are going have and are going to have you know some issues um, and are going to need to invest in figuring out how to best redevelop the malls. You know, do we do a partial redevelopment where we where we um, bring in entertainment, where we bring in multifamily? Um, some, you know, some of that break up that retail, uh, cluster, or is it more dire and we have to, you know, go to something that is much radically, uh, viewed, you know, viewed much radically different than the initial, uh, uh, initial, uh, initial use. So for instance, do you scrape them all? And because the, because the property value has declined significantly, can you turn it into affordable housing? Uh, certainly we see a number of communities going through that process right now. And, and my view is within the next two decades, we could easily see uh, 25, maybe even 50% of the roughly 1400 malls in America close. And, and, and that sounds dire, but, but put it in context, we built the first mall, America built the first mall in 1956. And so it makes sense that shopping patterns, the you know, time, uh, the availability schedule has, has changed and changed pretty dramatically in 60 years. So I, I think that it is somewhat of that is to be expected. One of the areas I think that's going to change on in the, in the future, um, and, and part of it driven by the pandemic, uh, is grocery anchored space. 
you think about it, it's essentially a small mall model. Say that many times fast, but think about it. You know, a mall, you have many anchors that draw in traffic and the inline space is able to convert some of that into sales. Well, think about that as far as the context of a grocery anchor center. You have a Publix or a Kroger or a Winn-Dixie that is the anchor that's the traffic draw and then the takeout place or the nail salon or the uh, cell phone store, you know, siphon off some of some of that uh, traffic and convert it into, uh, into sales. America, on, on, on the next slide, please. So you look at the U.S., our spending on e-grocery lags that of many other uh, Western, uh, Western European as, as well as Japan and South Korea. And, and you think about it, essentially food is, except for the perishability component, is a commodity not unlike books, electronics, sporting goods. And, and we know that e-commerce has been able and been very successful in shifting consumer buying habits in those areas. Mid-tier priced groceries are already facing some, you know, some, some headwinds. We've seen a few small chains that have filed for bankruptcy. But what we know are some of the large uh, supermarket chains are launching a wave of facilities that have the potential to disrupt uh, you know, grocery buying as we know it. Uh, for instance, Kroger comes to mind and they're launching a number of facilities that have the capability to uh, pick uh, upwards of 65,000 orders a week. Um, and so, you know, from that standpoint, uh, they probably can do it. Uh, they envision doing it very cost effectively. And then the question is, how do you get that uh, the last mile to the consumer. I'm not saying that you know all grocery stores are going away. I don't believe that at all. Certainly, a big uh, value driver for for grocery stores is convenience, is pre uh, prepackaged food, prepared food. So I think that you know we may see you know one or two the need for one or two less grocery stores out of say ten. Or 20 but I think that there will be some percentage that falls along the wayside and so certainly I think as you know communities are concerned certainly Florida has been uh, a very beneficial uh, you know it has benefited a lot from all of the grocery stores uh, built by Publix I built a few in a, in a prior lifetime but but certainly you do wonder about the ability of e-commerce to change and shift consumer buying habits in in this area, I think it's you know to be determined. But there is lots and lots of resources that are being put into this area. Now, on the next slide, let's spend a little bit of time. So, uh, in in my infinite spare time, I took uh, uh, did some took some liberties and kind of looked at the amount of retail space per capita. Uh, for the city of Northport, and then compared that against U.S. and Florida and some of the other neighboring communities. So you have, you know, Northport has uh, per capita less square footage than some of the other counties. Certainly, there, as in migration happens, there will be the need for more square footage of retail space. At the same point, we know that e commerce is shifting the dynamic around the delivery of goods um, and, and delivering them to home versus people going out. And so, you know, my view has been that the United States as a whole has too much square footage of retail space. Certainly, that is highly dependent on the makeup of the local economy. But maybe in this instance, you know, there's a, there would be the natural inclination to say, hey, you know, compared to Sarasota, we have half the square footage per capita and, and you know, certainly allow, you know, more and more building in that area. At the same point, certainly wonder if some of the square footage in, in certain areas in the U.S., and we know that's the case, um, you know, is, is excessive. 
And so from that standpoint, I view, I feel that, you know, a balanced economy, a balanced uh, perspective of commercial real estate, you know, is one that is probably, you know, the healthiest. Um, as far as office is concerned, and I know I've got about 10 minutes left and want to get to QA, so I will speed up just a little bit. You know, one of the things in office is that the dynamics are changing and changing very rapidly. The information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics on the segments that were the most successful, had the highest percentage of workers telecommuting, and it's finance, it's information, and it's professional and business services. We know that those areas have the greatest correlation to the use of office space. So I think that some high density markets are going to have some challenges in the future. We know, and I'll talk about it in a minute about you know the number of workers that will return to uh, return to the office. But again, you know, finding a balanced economy, um, you know, you 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 want to make sure that we're utilizing our real estate at the at the highest percentage highest percent of capacity that we can, because I think that areas that are underutilized certainly are going to create challenges and potentially create greater risks of, you know, potentially blight uh, in, in a community. And I, and, I, and I would use an example right now. Uh, you look at the, sta- the state of um, movie theaters. So, you know, movie theaters, it's, it's great to go to the movies. I love to do it. But when you think about it, a movie theater is only fully utilized, you know, after work for a few hours, um, especially, you know, when you have new releases on Friday and Saturday and not so not so well utilized on, you know, Monday and Tuesday night. Uh, and, and so from that standpoint, you know, it becomes more challenging from an economics point of view. Uh, as far as the finance finances of that space. And what we've seen is technology has been a very significant uh, place and, and we've been able to push several movies uh, out without even going to the box office. We've seen them come out via the streaming services. And so from that standpoint, you know, we may very well see a cohort, a group of movies that are developed and just go directly in, you know, to streaming. We already see some of that, but it may siphon off uh, some percentage that typically go to the box office. And so, from that standpoint, you know, we may have more movie theaters that have, you know, that have that have challenges. Um, looking at office space here, as far as uh, you know, the effects of COVID. So, on the left. Pre-COVID, uh, roughly 75% of workers reported working five days a week in the office. If we look at surveys, and surveys uh, are, are notoriously inaccurate, but certainly give us a view into the minds of the CEOs, COOs, CFOs, um, uh, the higher management of companies and what they're thinking. And in this instance, we're thinking we're going to flip-flop. Uh, that and roughly 30% of workers may be working full time in the office. So I think that we'll see a pretty dynamic uh, focus on ringing out efficiency in in some of the office space. Additionally, I think that we're going to see uh, some industries that may not return to the office. For instance, uh, you think about uh, IT support. If your computer had challenges like mine did on on several occasions, I could call a 1-800 number and someone could remote access the computer uh, and and fix it. Think about call centers. We can, you know, businesses already have the technology to track the number of people online, how fast the calls are being completed, the quality of calls, et cetera. And do we need to have... Do we need to pay for space for those folks to come to work? I think it's it's going to be a question going forward, and I, I think that some of the industries, you know, will will not return, which may create you know some challenges. I mean, you think about Jacksonville and its concentration to back office uh, back office support. Um, so there may be the need for for less flex office, but certainly you know we continue to to kind of watch uh, that dynamic. So. 
as I talked about earlier, there are areas of the Office of the Future um, that we know well. There are areas that are still being determined. And so kind of walking through that on the next slide, areas of greater confidence in my view. So we know that more people today are working remotely. We know technology is enabling greater space efficiency. So we're seeing more businesses that are talking about impl implementing systems for hot desking, uh, hoteling dynamics, those kind of uh, areas of office. Know that some area industries are more prone to let workers utilize alternative work, i.e. call centers, etc. I think more space is going to be needed per full-time equivalent position. I think that we're, you know, there's still a very sizable stigma right now around, you know, safety uh, for for office space, and so I think businesses will need to provide, uh, you know, more square footage for workers, uh, somewhat for a sentiment perspective. Greater building capex and operating expense, expenses. I think one of the areas we will see come out of this is we'll see some change in codes um, as far as requiring more air changes per hour, which will require more investment in air handlers and fans, which will then lead to more expenses as electricity is concerned. I think directly for Northport, you know, low cost markets are thriving at the expense of, of high cost density, uh, high cost, high density markets. Uh, and, and so from that, I think that, uh, you know, targeting some of those high density markets uh, to begin to bring some folks in is certainly, you know, a, a, a probably a very sound strategy. Tasks requiring collaboration, the cross pollinization of ideas, networking, culture, by far and away are much, much more efficiently conducted in in-person environments versus the virtual ones. So I think we will see a significant amount of folks return to the office. Areas where we're still uncertain, we don't know whether the virus will reemerge. We don't know how a safe workplace will be defined. Um, I suspect that our, our friends in the legal industry uh, will be working hard to help us define that for the next decade or so. Um, I think that the new workplace and employee implications around sediment are to be determined. Um, but certainly on that front, uh, we continue to watch. On the, on the next slide, free is good. Um, and this is information that the Atlanta Fed puts out. Um, this is our commercial real estate momentum index. And you can see that we look at a number of the variables that go into driving commercial real estate. And so we are rating communities as far as if the momentum in commercial real estate um, is accelerating or decelerating. So an orange result means it's accelerating. A blue result, a darker result means it's decelerating. And you can go and you can look at our thoughts on some of the individual variables on the right. We have uh, a you know view of construction forecast in the industrial space. And you can see in green that essentially most of the markets in the U.S., uh, outside of a handful or so are kind of right along the the green shading, which means it's right along the, the long-term average, roughly 20 years of data. On the next slide, certainly we're receiving lots of questions about cap rates these days as there's been movement in the 10-year treasury. Uh, as you know, cap rates are very high, uh, you know, very uh, impactful on the value of commercial real estate as essentially it communicates a level, a rate of return. And what you can see here is that during the pandemic, we had the spread between the tenure, between cap rates and the 10 year treasury widen greatly. And now all of a sudden in the last couple of quarters, we begin to see that uh, result decline pretty markedly as we've seen some growth in the 10 year treasury. The question is, you know, are we beginning to see more risk? I think um, uh, in, in, in that respect, there is a lot of capital on the sidelines that is looking to be placed right now. And from that standpoint, 
uh, my view is that is really going to drive the dynamics of cap rates going forward. Certainly, there are some inputs which may change a little bit of that if there's uh, changes in uh, tax rates or some uh, legislative changes, then you could see some shifts in cap rates. But right now, really the primary driver uh, is the amount of capital on the sidelines. And so my expectation is that if all things remain the same, which we know they don't, but if they do, uh, I think that we'll continue to see some compression in cap rates and increasing values, uh, you know, in the in the uh, in the near future. On the on the next slide, you know, one of the questions we're getting a lot is questions about inflation. So we've seen rises uh, in prices at the gas pumps. Uh, we've seen building materials, some building materials rise pretty rapidly. And you know, Chair Powell, as I talked about at the FOMC, at the F, at the March FOMC conference, you know, his expectations are that we were going to see more inflation just as we just because of of uh, dynamics associated with the calculation. So, for instance, you have the very low uh, inflationary rates that we experienced in March and April of 2020 dropping off. And we've got, you know, more accelerated pickups, more, uh, uh, you know, accelerating costs in some areas. But the thought is at this point, you know, that we believe that these effects are transitory. They're temporary uh, and, and will not last uh, a, long, a long period of time. And so our view is the, from the FOMC on the next slide, as you can look at GDP on the top, You've seen, you know, a, de a decline in 2020, but the expectations are for the 17 uh, individuals that put together forecast in 2021 that we'll see GDP growth uh, for 2021 uh, around six and a half percent. So certainly a very, very strong uh, rebound, you know, the likes of which we've not experienced uh, in the last several decades. On the bottom, we see, you know, uh, the uptick, uptick in unemployment from 2019 to 2020. And what we see is that, you know, the expectation is that unemployment will be down around four and a half percent at the end of the year. So in closing, I would just kind of impart the wisdom that you know, economic activity has rebounded. We've put back, we've returned about 60 to 65 percent of the 20 to of the 22 million jobs that were lost. Some areas will take longer than others, especially uh, lower skilled uh, workers, uh, which I know that that Florida has, you know, an, an abundance of as far as, you know, the hospitality sector is concerned. You know, hotel and retail, you know, have, have faced the brunt of the loss of economic activity, but they are being positively impacted uh, by the you know by the re reopenings. Uh, you know, some of the, my expectation is that a good portion will rebound. It will take a, a, a period of time as they have some scarring, but there are going to be some areas that continue to face very sizable challenges, and in some instances may not recover. I.e., you know, some of the B and C malls, office, the office sector, you know, is facing some headwinds. Uh, some of the most recent activity is promising, but I think that there are there's greater uncertainty around what the future what the future space looks like what the percent of, of remote workers are and and safe you know what is the definition of safe space and while i think that all of that in the long term will turn out positive i think in the short medium term you know it, when we have areas times of greater uncertainty then we have you know challenges in in that area so maybe the bounce back will not be quite as as robust and pronounced uh, for areas that are having you know combination of out migration lower population growth etc and and then risk continues to evolve whether changes in consumer behavior space lending etc you know they will continue to impact commercial real estate um but certainly you know i think that uh, uh we've seen we've seen the dynamics uh, work out work out pretty well so we continue to monitor risk going forward and with that marianne uh if i have a question or two i would uh, be happy to take this 
first of all, let's thank Brian Bailey for his insightful presentation. Thank you, Brian. He's been a good friend for North, of Northport for many, many years, and we really appreciate his presentation. We have had a few questions that have come in via email. The first one is regarding the uh, right sizing of retail and the fact that Northport looks fair, looks great. What are you, what are you looking at in the future? You mentioned that there was going to be a greater emphasis on what is the right per capita square footage. What kind of indicators are you looking at, Brian? Right. So I think I think you know. So what we know is that. Um, some retail has actually excelled during the downturn. So areas, retail, where the business owners were able to evolve their business, you know, their, their, their business as far as more, you know, adding a greater percentage of takeout. Um, services, I think, still held up relatively well. It's areas primarily around good, the sellers of goods that are facing, you know, have, have, pardon me, have faced some pretty sizable challenges. And so I, I think that as you're looking at the potential for uh, approving projects in your community, I think that one of the questions I, I would respectfully offer up and, and suggest that you'd ask is, you know, what areas, what niches are the tenants in this space going to fill? Are they more geared toward providing services, providing takeout, uh, adding value? I mean, I've seen some uh, uh, dynamics here in Atlanta, which you know, surprised about. You know, you think about prepared food has been uh, you know a, a very a very uh, significant driver of of some retail here in Atlanta. Again, it has to be uh, right for your community, but I think. I would uh, I would offer the question, you know, what niches within the community are these business is this space going to allow businesses to fill? Thank you, Brian. Is there any questions from the audience at this time? If not, I have two more questions that came in via email, and, and that's all the time we have. Is there was a feedback and question about that wonderful slide you had on slide twenty five that the Atlanta Fed compiles information on the robustness or lack of robustness in the commercial real estate sector. And so for the benefit of our audience and for those online, that is atlantafed.org, which leads me to the next question, which is, is your presentation in the PDF form going to be available to the audience? Brian? Absolutely. I'm going to send a PDF version to Sandra as soon as we get off. And uh, more than happy to uh, uh, provide that. If you've got any additional questions, you know, please feel free to, to route them uh, through the uh, City of Northport's economic development team. Thank you. Let's give Brian another That's hand. Fabulous as always. Good friend. Folks, he shares the dais with members of the Board of Governors from the Federal Reserve, and now he's sharing the dais with us here in the City of Northport. Again, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. At this time, we're going to transition into some business testimonials, and our Office of Economic Development is going to share some videos. It will be Mike Dunn with the Atlanta Braves and Mike Zerbriggen with um, Eurowall. So take it away, technology. <laughs> Years now of our professional baseball career right here in Northport. This $160 million investment encompasses 90 acres in Welland Park, and we're excited to be able to showcase our future Atlanta Braves from the baseball field. Uh, we're also equally as excited as uh, turning the complex into a year-round facility, uh, whether it's our tiki bar, special events, amateur sports, whatever it is, we uh, utilize the complex to its fullest capacity. The thing that made it really appealing to us was and land, and certainly the ability for multiple agencies to work well together. So in our scenario, we had five parties at the table uh, working for this uh, complex. And at the end of the day, this is the end result. So uh, we're thrilled to be here. We're thrilled to call Northport home, and we look forward to seeing you at the ballpark really soon.
It was perfect in the run through. Just one more. <laughs> Here we go. One more. Uh, my name's Mike, and I'm from Eurowall Systems. And why Northport? Uh, simple. It's opportunity. Uh, we partner uh, with local government. They're fantastic. They actually want to work with you to help you get across the finish line instead of uh, trying to tell you what you're doing wrong and how it needs to be or it should be. And we find that to be uh, a big difference. Well, I think what's great for us is opportunity. So we're a growing business. And so whether it's infrastructure, whether it's location, whether it's distribution, uh, we just find we're close to 75. We've got a proactive local government. The economy's great. The infrastructure's super. We've got uh, you know, development here. Uh, I mean, what's not to like? I mean, just across the board, it's just really it's like a greenhouse for business right here. I mean, yes, we do manufacture doors, but really what we get – is the opportunity to be able to help people grow, uh, and and you know whether it be uh, our customers, our vendors, our employees, uh, we build doors for people, and we want to try to improve that experience however we can. That what we found is that we've got a great atmosphere and environment, pro business from everybody on the government side. They're looking to help you grow and not uh, penalize you if you made a mistake. They want to teach you and help you, so it's a big difference. Um, it's new. The infrastructure's here. Uh, I could go on and on. In fact, I will if you let me. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. I really appreciate how Mayor Jill Luke kicked off our presentation with talking about the exciting future for Northport. And we heard exciting statistics from Brian Bailey about Northport, both in terms of uh, the robustness of our retail sector, robustness in terms of our unemployment rate, robustness in terms of home appreciation, all very positive things. And then we heard those wonderful testimonies. So it's wonderful to transition now into our next sector. And at this time, I'd like to invite Nell Thomas to the lectern. And I was, I was very sad a few days ago to read on the front page of the newspaper that she was retiring, but very, very happy to hear that her <laughs> retirement is on hold. We are oh very, very, very fortunate to have someone of Nell Thomas's caliber leading the charge for the city of Northport with economic development. She's an ambassador, she's articulate, she's oh knowledgeable, and we're very, very fortunate to have her. Please join me in welcoming Mel Thomas. Nice. That's nice. I should retire more often. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, I've tried twice before and was not successful, so apparently I'm not cut out for retirement. I don't know. I am so happy to be in Northport. I'm so happy that some circumstances have changed that allow me to stay. Um, I want to thank Mary Ann. She has been stalwart uh, in terms of helping us with this summit. <clears throat> We've been doing this for, the, well, it started six years ago. Mary Ann has been at the table. Bruce, Debbie, Debbie Stoughton. We've got ambassadors who've been working with us for a long time for the city in a volunteer capacity. They're brilliant, they're wonderful, they're encouraging. And so I want to thank them too. I have one more, Bob Woodhall, who's listening in from uh, Houston, Texas right now, who's been with us for years and since the summit. Um, but he moved away from us, and I know Bob is out there listening, and we just want to thank him from afar. Uh, I, I thought Ruth Buchanan was going to be in the house today. I was going to give a nod to her because this was originally her brainchild. And um, I don't see her, but maybe she's listening in. So Ruth nod to you. Um, again, thank you uh, for, for being here with us. This is an amazing event, and we are so excited that we are on a precipice here in Northport. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't also uh, talk to you just a minute about the growth of economic development in the city of Northport. Um, we've, we've really lucky to have a dynamite team, and I do want to recognize them. They're on the back of your program, I believe, but you have been in touch with at least one of these people as you registered for this event. None of this would have happened without Sandra Duffy. So I just want to, Sandra, you're brilliant, wonderful. We love you. Thank you for being here and with us. Um, she is my brains. I don't know what I'd do without her. Um, and then I want to recognize our new intern, Destiny Garris, um, she's a USF student. Oh my gosh, amazing. We're going to bring along the future, right? We're doing that with our internships. 
And then a new, uh, two new employees, Caitlin Steltzer, where are you? Oh yeah, over here. <laughs> and Kirsten Peterson, who has been madly running around the building trying to keep things in order. So that's my team, and I just want, I do want to thank um, to Interim City Manager because he has been an amazing support for all of us, and thank you, Jason. Let's talk a little bit, let's uh, bring this back from Brian's amazing um, talk. You know, Brian has caused me um, over the years to really have a lot of fodder, you know, those things that you put in your brain and you allow it to mix and mingle and uh, with other thoughts that you have, but his foresightfulness, his ability to interpret numbers, spin the stories, tell you what's going on, is really what makes him superior. And so we so appreciate his time with us. And I, I, I want to just um, try to latch on to some of that local information that he gave you and tell you how we have come to a new place in Northport, which you're going to hear about very shortly. Um, First, know a few things about Northport. You all realize this is a hybrid event, and we have people actually signed up for this who are all over the country. So we have commercial realtors, developers, bankers, um, people in the financial world of all places in the, um, in the country. They're visiting with us now. They don't know much about Northport. So I want to share just a few things with you. First of all, one of the cute little branding things we've come up with is that we are 104 square miles of opportunity. And if you don't believe that, you should just, I don't know, go away right now because <laughs> um, you are obviously here because you do believe that and you want to learn more about that. Um, we've grown 238% in the last two decades in terms of population. Now, that's an amazing amount of growth. We're at 77,600 and some odd numbers here. That's our population currently. Uh, we have an average age of 46 the youngest working age group in our MSA, um, Northport, Sarasota, Bradenton. So we have a workforce here that's amazing and trained and a pipeline of future growth workers. So we, we, we're, we're obviously blessed and we're poised in that way. You, you probably know uh, that we're going to be hitting that 100,000 person mark very soon and that makes a huge difference in how developers, people who are building bringing industry, that's a mark for them, and it's a very important mark. And so we're, we need to prepare for that because population here is going to grow no matter what, whether we bring, whether we bring industry or business or not. We're, we're a pre-platted city. It's set up for residential growth, and that's going to happen, okay? So what have we got to do? You know, well, the, the thing about my job and those of my team, um, it basically is to... Um, help balance or bring balance to the revenues that support this quality of life that is simply amazing in Northport. I mean, we have, we have schools, we have uh, uh, parks, we have open space with blue ways. But in addition to that, you know, we've got uh, an ability now to maintain that quality of life if we can find a way to bring commercial and business and industrial um, uh, growth to bear in this city. Um, that's going to help balance the revenues and who, who's paying the heavy tax burden. So quickly, currently, for every dollar that's invested, or that's, I'm sorry, not invested, but every dollar that is paid into taxes in the city, a resident consumes $1.25 of that, where businesses are consuming 75 cents of that. We need to balance that so that we have a less of a burden on our citizenry and we have corporate America sort of picking up that difference, that will make quality of life here so much better for everyone. And so that's the, that's the point at which when I came here and I know these things about the city, I look around and we have phone calls or with people knocking on the door, gosh, you've got all this space, I'd like to come there. And I would have to say, I'm sorry, I have no place for you to go. Because we had no shovel ready anything. We had not developed that space appropriately, nor had we defined it. And so herein lie, lies the dilemma, right? You have, to, um, you have to find a way to express to leadership and to people who've been living in a place for a long time that they need to take a different look. Maybe just turn the lens a little bit and then look at something from a slightly different angle. 
And that's what we've done. And we've done that basically by um, going out to look for uh, someone who could do a feasibility study for us, a market feasibility study for economic development. Uh, enter, if you will, Camoyne Associates. We found the most amazing consulting group. They fit our need so well. And um, I want to just, I'm going to shift now because I need to read. I'll leave something important out if I don't. Um, Camoyne Associates is out of Syracuse, New York, and they provide full service economic development consulting across the country and have since 1999. Among their corporate clients are Lowe's Home Improvement, FedEx, Amazon, Volvo, and the New York Islanders, for those of you who are into the sports world. Um, today we have with us Senior Vice President Jim Demesis and Director of Research Tom Dworsky, our project lead, who we've worked with now for over six months, um, Ms. Alex Tranmer, is traveling, so she's not with us today. I'm so sad because she's been an amazing partner, and I expect she will continue to be. Um, they're going to re review with you today the market analysis conclusions, their action plan for Northport, the development scenarios and fiscal benefit analysis, and an approach for financing utilities and infrastructure projects that they've identified for this city. No doubt you're going to be totally amazed about what you learn. I don't know anybody who's seen this report that didn't have a jaw drop of some sort, especially when they see numbers. The numbers are going to amaze you. So the Camoyne study, and that's what we call it lovingly now because we named it for them, uh, the Camoyne study was so well received that the city, our city commission was brave and bold. God love them. They gave us a 5-0 vote to adopt the plan citywide. Further, they voted to support the study by committing American Recovery Act funds in the millions toward building out the water and sewer infrastructure in preparation for specific site development. Now, um, I'm really pleased to introduce Jim Demesis, Senior Vice President of Camoyne, to you, and he's going to present the Camoyne study and its findings. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mel. Uh, this is Jim Demesis. Can I, can everybody hear me? I'm remote, so. Yep. Okay. Um, thank you for being here, for letting us be here today, Mel. And I pretty much just want to jump to questions because you kind of said it all. And uh, thank you for that um, great introduction as well. We really appreciate it. Um, it is Northport study. Uh, we're happy that you mentioned that you call it or refer to it as the Camoyne study, but we are only successful if our clients are successful. And this was a really good collaborative project, uh, right from the interviews that we were doing, uh, the uh, briefings that we had, um, right down to the data analysis and the final vote to um, approve it. So um, we're going to be brief and give an overview, but this is, um, let me just, before I turn it over, uh, we're going to have a few different uh, slides that we want to show that hit the highlights. Uh, but before I do that, I want to say this is, um, the setup for this was perfect with the data and the information about the national economy and the Fed talking about that. And then, um, the coming out of COVID and so forth, there is, we are definitely, and this is not just Northport, but everywhere, coming out of a period of lots of uncertainty and change. And you can look at that and say, hey, let's just get through this and hope that uh, things get better in the future, and they will, so let's just stay the course. Or you could look at that and say, it's time to pivot, and as Mel says, look at it through a different lens and say, let's use this opportunity of federal funds coming in, of new opportunities for economic growth coming out of COVID and the changes in the market and be prepared for that change um, so, uh, so that we can be uh, prosperous with our economy. Um, so let me, let me, um, if we can, um, share the screen, Tom, we'll go over some of the slides here. Um, so what we did was, um, I was looking on my end, I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing the slides, but I'm not seeing them as a show. I'm seeing them as a, uh, Oh, um, let me see if I can. Just give us one second here. 
There. Oh, no. Sorry. Just give us a second here. I wish I was there in person. For those of you, uh, I'm actually calling in from the state of Maine, uh, which is a beautiful state, but not quite as uh, nice weather. Is that not working, Jim? No, I'm seeing on my end, I'm seeing the, um, the actual software, but I mean, I can see the slide, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, we can walk through it that way, Tom, if you just want to do that. Yeah, go go ahead. I'll, while you're talking, I'll try to fix it, but you should be able to see it. Like, just go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So let me just give a little bit of background um, So about Kamoin. Um, so we're, we're a full-service economic development, um, economic analysis firm. We were founded in 1999 uh, by my partner, Rob Kamoin. Uh, we do everything from market analysis and feasibility studies to strategic planning to workforce analysis and more. Um, we completed over a thousand projects. Uh, we have on here 41 states, but I think we're now up to 43 since this was published. Um, we have approximately full, uh, 25 full-time staff. And uh, while we were uh, headquartered in Saratoga Springs, New York, um, and an office in Richmond, Virginia. Um, based on COVID, we've pivoted to, to be completely remote and are probably going to stay that way as well. And it works really good for us. Um, let me talk a little bit next slide, Tom, about the purpose of the, of the project. So um, I'm going to be really high level. And as uh, Mel said, the report is available. Um, and I just put down there on the bottom of the slide where it's available from the city's website. But um, and it's pretty dense. While we had a lot of we had a brief executive summary with the strategies and what the key takeaways are, it's all supported by quite a bit of data, which actually was interesting because one of the challenges when you're a firm that bases their you know strategies on lots of data typically a lot of people don't read it but i got to tell you this council this this group the, um, they read it all when we were interviewing them they were saying hey on page 125 i see this and that was really refreshing uh, that we had a client that was that engaged and by client i mean the entire city um, but the purpose was to understand opportunities in the regional market for economic growth and prosperity identify the opportunities that you're best suited for and determine what actions the city must take to capitalize on these opportunities. And I want to be clear, um, the, um, it was with that purpose, it wasn't just growth and prosperity of any time, it was of any type. It was the kind of growth and, um, and opportunities that exist to diversify the economy, as Mel was saying, to shift that from, from residential growth or reliance only on residential growth to looking at commercial, retail, industrial, and other kinds of activity. Um, next slide. The, uh, so what were some of the market realities? Again, high level. Um, the residential market is lucrative and will continue to dominate without land use policy intervention. In other words, um, you can do this all day. And it's a great region in a great state and a great city to live. So the demand for residential development has been and will continue to be high. And that shouldn't be a negative thing. That's a good thing that people want to live there. It means they value where we value your place. Um, however, it does have economic consequences. Nearly 90% of Northport's workers commute to other locations for work. So as it was mentioned before by Mel, it's a really good thing that you've got lots of people, you're growing, you've got lots of young people, which is a challenge in many locations, um, and you have lots of workers. The problem is, is that they're going somewhere else to work and you therefore are leaking economic opportunity 
and fiscal revenues by not capturing that. Um, so it's in a way it's draining. It's probably too a bit of an overstatement. The local skill, talent, and business potential. It's helping the region. It's helping the city, but it could be helping more in terms of economics. Uh, private sector job growth is dependent on shovel-ready sites and workforce availability. So having a great place that people want to live is an important ingredient of economic development. But in today's world, investors, developers, companies that want to locate or expand, time matters and cost matters. So they're going to be looking for and have plenty of places that they can go where there are good sites that are zoned and have the infrastructure ready to go. Next slide, Tom. So the imperatives for economic development, what does this mean? Um, and again, there's way more detail in the report, but I want to hit on the high levels for this summit. Um, the, the imperatives for going forward are identify and codify sites that can support commercial development. And that was a, a large part of this work was to look, and Tom is gonna to give you more about the data. Um, however, um, it's we didn't just look at the city as a whole, we went into different districts and vetted what the opportunities were in there, what the growth has been and what the sites are that can support future commercial development. Commit to funding structure that will support shovel ready development. And good to report as Mel already did, that that funding stream is all already in the works in terms of taking advantage of the fact that there's recovery funds. And then finally, um, aligning the local workforce training with key sectors that will be attracted to Northport. So it's important that you help the regional economy and align with it in terms of your workforce, but you also want to make sure that you can capture that workforce to support the kinds of industries and kinds of development that will help your city um, as well. Next, Tom. So let me turn it over to Tom, who's going to talk uh, briefly about the different areas that we looked at and then what we found in terms of why this is like why it's imperative to make the change, but not only why, but what the benefits can be. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, Tom Duretsky here. Um, so I'll just be kind of talking at a high level of some of the findings from the study. Um, I'll start just kind of since this is the real estate summit, kind of focusing on the development opportunity areas that we identified. So as Jim said, we kind of looked at the city of the whole as a whole and identified five key areas for development that we thought we that had a lot of potential for the types of uses that uh, work in the market for Northport and that the city is interested in attracting to this to um, Northport. So I'll just kind of go through them briefly. Um, you know, some of you might not be as familiar with the city, but for those who are, um, the first one is is Gateway, which is the area at the interchange between Sumter and I-75. There's parcels on all four quadrants of that interchange. And the uses that would be appropriate there um, kind of range across commercial uses, office, medical, retail, restaurant, and hotel. Um, the second area is the north side of the Panacea Activity Center, which is the area at Toledo Blade um, and north of 75, and that can support a range of commercial and industrial uses, uh, manufacturing, warehouse and distribution, light industrial, flex, office, um, and also retail and restaurant. Uh, the third one is the springs, which is the area around Warm Mineral Springs Park, um, which makes sense as kind of a health and wellness hotel, restaurant, kind of visitor-oriented type uh, use area that would play off of the park. Um, and then the, the, the fourth one, Heron Creek, um, which is uh, along Sumter Boulevard, uh, more towards the center of the city. Um, that would be uh, ideal for kind of a mixed use commercial and with some medium density residential um, and similar for Midway, which is on the, the other end of the city um, along Toledo Blade and Price, also mixed use commercial medium density residential. Um, so the, the first three areas here, Gateway, Panacea and the Springs, 
currently uh, are not shovel ready because there's a lack of water, water and wastewater infrastructure. The city's gotten some development interest in these areas, but um, you know, oftentimes when investors are finding that they aren't currently served, um, they kind of move on. So that was kind of really part of the imperative here is um, these are sites that are well located. Um, and if they did have the infrastructure, they'd be in high demand. So that's part of kind of um, the study here. So I'll just kind of hit some of the highlights of the analysis here. Um, as Jim said, the full report is uh, low, is can be found on the city's website on the economic development page. But I'll kind of just highlight what we looked at. So we did an analysis that looked at the build out potential of these opportunity uh, opportunity areas um, and kind of how much they could contribute and assess value to the city's tax base and compared the estimated cost to extend infrastructure to those areas to that uh, potential increase in assessed value. Um, so the first table here just kind of summarizes that for the three areas that don't have currently have the water and sewer, the cost to extend those is estimated working with the city's um, DPW department and then then a build out analysis and then it kind of gives a range of potential um, return on investment so to speak so a dollar of uh, infrastructure investment could yield up to two hundred ninety dollars of taxable assessed value in um, in panacea uh, north of 75 for example um, so th this is really helping the city to start to prioritize infrastructure investment, showing how an upfront investment um, will pay off with private investment that's many times greater and really generate those tax dollars and jobs that Northport is looking for. Um, and then from a jobs creation um, standpoint, the, the second table on this slide here for the different areas, we're, we're talking about a huge amount of new jobs if um, you know these areas are built out from on the low end 4,000 all the way up to 18,000 plus new jobs could be um, attracted to Northport in these areas. So it, we're really talking about substantial new investment and um, expansion in the employment base that could occur here. So the bottom line really is it's important for the city to act and ensure these opportunity areas are development ready and the city's already doing that. Um, Northport, as it becomes increasingly attractive as a place to invest for all types of commercial development, it's really important to make sure that there are well-located sites available that can support this development. Um, you know, if no action is taken to make sure these uh, strategic sites are preserved for commercial and industrial uses, that will really help generate those tax dollars and jobs and support quality of life. Um, you know, there is a risk that some of these sites could be consumed for single family and that opportunity will be gone. Um, so really, you know, our recommendation is for the city to prioritize the areas where commercial developments desired, invest in extending that infrastructure and really make sure policies are in place to preserve that land so that when investors do come along, um, you know, there's a uh, well-located uh, location for them to uh, develop. And that kind of wraps up our presentation. So I uh, might be running a little late, but I'll turn it back over to Mel to moderate the Q and A if we have time for that. Oh, hi again. Um, thank you both. That was excellent information, and you um, were able to get 170 pages into uh, just a few <laughs> slides, but it was all informative. Uh, so I want to take questions. We've got a few. Actually, uh, we had a comment, and that is, oh. thank you, Mel, for not retiring. <laughs> <laughs> is that it? That was all yeah. from our, oh, our email. So it's open to the audience. Okay. Is there any follow-up questions? Oh, yeah. And if you have a question, if you'll um, go to our other podium, that would be nice. Anybody have questions? Tony, why don't you go up? It's Tony Gastaitis approaching here, who's a local realtor. He and his wife own a, the Keller Williams in the area. Okay. Hello, everybody. My biggest concern would be, uh, you know, from the study, what would be the first location they would recommend that we start running the water and sewer utilities and broadband to there? Hey, did you hear the question, Tom or Jim? Yeah, yeah. So I did. Um, 
I think let me just start by saying I don't want to elude the question, but it's there are we did try to do it in a way that allowed for more than one area, but I do know that you need to start somewhere. Um, so there were potentials in each of the areas. Um, but Tom, you want to talk a little bit more about the, the those that came out in terms of the highest priority? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I would say so. There, of the five areas, there are three that do need infrastructure investment. The first three on the slide here: Gateway, Panacea, and the Springs. In terms of you know being able to support the most uh, development, um, Gateway and Panacea are quite a bit larger than the Springs. Um, so you know, for purely from a uh, fiscal standpoint, Gateway and Panacea would give the biggest bang for the buck. Um, but you know, the Springs is also important because it offers a kind of different. Uh, flavor of development, an important district in the in the community as well. Yeah, and I think just to follow up on that, it's like it is important. Like, well, while, while prioritization is really important, so that you can focus your resources. There is also importance of diversity and also getting community buy-in, so that everybody feels that there's potentials near where they live or near where they own property too. So um, that's why it was already prioritized down to this group of this region uh, or these districts, if you will. Um, but we further then, like Tom said, the ones that have the sort of most potential impact were the first three. First two, I'm sorry. Uh, let me make one comment uh, to update everybody. The gateway, area um, is only a month away from going out to bid, I believe, for the run of utilities and so I'm looking at my city manager and back at the wall for utilities people. But I believe that's right. So we will be seeing activity, um, water and sewer being run through those areas very, very quickly. So that's a high priority and we have funded it completely. We have time for one more question. I see Rich Suggs has a question. Good morning. My name is Rich Suggs, um, resident here in Northport. Seems like we have one bite at this apple, and so we need to kind of get it right the first time. And there were a lot of up twos in those numbers, up to $290 for every dollar we spent, and up to 18,000 jobs. But there were some down or lower numbers. And I would like to ask Kamoin if they have. Uh, any ideas on how we maximize? What types of businesses, what types of industries should we be looking for to uh, maximize those numbers instead of minimizing them? Yeah, no, great question. And, and yeah, and I know with as consultants, we uh, we had to put a range in there, partly because, and, and this is important, is uh, it's a good question because it's not like the city owns all the land and can do whatever it wants. So the 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 it's an interplay with the public and the private sector to to determine what actually gets done there. And the same thing with um, targeting like the kinds of businesses. The market will ultimately determine that. Um, so that's what creates some of the the range essentially that you see there. Um, Tom, do you want to, I think the, uh, maybe you can hit on just a couple of highlights, Tom, of what sort of drives the higher end of the number versus the lower end. Mm -hmm. And again, it's all meant to be good. In other words, these were good opportunities even towards the lower end, but I understand the question, which is, can we squeeze the lemon to get towards the higher end? Yeah, sure. So there's kind of two things that drive that range. One is the level of density that's allowed. So if you, and you know, obviously different areas, different density is appropriate for them, but the higher density um, development that is allowed that, you know, allows for more buildable area in a given district and therefore more assessed value and more jobs and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and the second factor is kind of the, uh, the mix of use types too. So the higher end, higher value stuff, um, you know, is more the, the office, the hotel um, type development. 
um, versus um, less value per square foot is more on the industrial side. Of course, you don't want only the highest value, you need a mix. So, um, you know, those are kind of the different things that uh, impact the range there. And all those assumptions are in the report too, if you're interested. Yeah, just the final takeaway there is if as long as you're doing getting those sites ready and doing a mix, you're going to be somewhere in the middle of that of that range, which again is all positive about relieving the stress on the residential taxpayer. Okay, Jim and Tom, and uh, we really appreciate your. Um, your question, your answers for our questions here in Northport. We know you're available, and uh, if we have other questions, I'm sure you'll be able to answer them for us. We'll do those electronically. So thank you thank for you. being with us, and um, I think I'm also supposed to introduce the next video. Did we have another something else? One is that right? Certainly, okay. I'll go ahead. And so, so the um, we had originally planned to have Dustin Wells in person with us today. Dustin is the vice president of the Sarasota County Economic Development Corporation. Unfortunately, he's not able to be with us, some a higher calling, I guess. Um, and so he, he, he is going to be on video and it was produced very late in the day yesterday. And so we haven't even really had a chance to view it. So you're gonna, you're gonna preview right along with us. You'll understand, Dustin's a great, he's my previous boss actually. I was at the EDC before I came here. He is wonderful, he's smart, he's imaginative, and he's got all kinds of great information for us. A well-oiled machine in this thing. We go. Hello everyone, this is Dustin Wells, Vice President of Business Development at the Economic Development Corporation of Sarasota County. Uh, very happy to be here with you today. Really exciting for this real estate summit. Uh, every time that this has been put on by the city, it gets better and better and I'm just excited to be able to be here with you, albeit via Zoom, of which myself included and many of you uh, probably a little Zoomed out after this last year and a half, but uh, in any case, excited to be here, uh, share just a couple minutes. Want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing going on, what's happening in the real estate market on the residential side, on the office side, about uh, some of our light industrial side as well. Um, what's driving uh, some of the growth that we're seeing in our community, uh, some of the work that the city has done, as well as the Economic Development Corporation around land use and trying to identify where are we going to be putting jobs in the future, given our population growth? Uh, and then finally wrapping up with some information about our uh, incentive programs and some of the ways that we support businesses uh, that are diversifying our economy and creating good quality uh, jobs and careers in our community. So uh, first, let's go into what's going on. So we're, we're, we'll start off on the residential side. Right now, things are booming like we can't even really believe and understand. Inventories are at all-time lows. Um, uh, anecdotally, I can share with you, I have a friend who is a, a newly residential broker uh, in the region here, and she was working with a client who, uh, sight unseen, $50,000 over asking cash offer and actually was rejected, which uh, is pretty astonishing. But the influx of folks coming uh, from around the country, really, and this migration that's really happening nationwide, I think really spurned by the pandemic, but was happening beforehand as well, is really going to show uh, itself in our residential market. So that's where we're seeing a lot of prices. The supply is low, the demand is through the roof. Those principles always come into play. And right now that's what you're seeing in our market with our prices. Um, switching gears over to the office side, very strange market. A lot of two big competing forces going on right now. Um, we've had dependent upon the industry sector some folks that have been able to downsize their office space or even give up their office space altogether, go remote, not lose any productivity. In fact, perhaps even pick up a little bit of productivity. Um, some of them are getting a little bit tired of being at home all the time. I want to come back into the office place. But, but the, the, the footprint of office, I think, in the future is likely to shrink to a certain degree as a hybrid work model uh, and more remote working will keep a localized headcount perhaps down a bit more than it has in the past. Um, now, countering that influence is the influx of folks coming in. So a lot of business, particularly from the Northeast and from the upper Midwest. So, so the markets we're seeing most activity from coming in, uh, New York and Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., um, Atlanta, 
interestingly, uh, another, you know, what we typically consider a competitor in the Southeast, um, a big spike and uptick of, of relocations from Atlanta into the area. So, so that's countering some of the downsizing. So any vacancies that are opening up from uh, people giving up some of their space is being scooped up by other people coming into the market. So which force is going to be a bit stronger will likely dictate what we see uh, to some of those office lease rates uh, moving forward. Uh, finally, we'll talk about light industrial on, on, on the categories there. And light industrial, it's tough. Uh, right now, throughout the entire county, we really don't have much uh, opportunity for uh, some light industrial you know, manufacturing in particular to come into town. Uh, and the reason for that is we have a ton of land, but we don't have sites uh, that have infrastructure, that have the roads, the connectivity uh, that are truly ready uh, for uh, a company to come in and conduct that activity. Um, however, there is a lot of great work going on. You know, kudos to the city of Northport and Mel Thomas, the head of economic development, and Sandra, uh, who's, who's done, a, as I understand it, a ton of work in, in pulling off today's event. Um, you know, they do a wonderful job. They did this study with Kamoin identifying you know, where these high potential areas are, coming up with strategies uh, for growth. And so it's, it's the ILW challenge, at least, is recognized, being studied. And we're making the progress towards bringing some more sites online and thus some more opportunities uh, for businesses to come here, thrive, create jobs that we very much need. So what's driving the growth, uh, particularly in the state of Florida? Our business climate is phenomenal. No personal income tax. 99% of companies don't pay state corporate income tax. Uh, no state tax. Um, in Sarasota County, our property taxes are some of the lowest in the state, number 60 out of 67, if number one is the most expensive. Um, in Northport, tremendous opportunity. The, the population growth, 20,000 in the year 2000, now pushing up on 80,000. And, um, you know, you see labor force as such a driver in what's happening in economic development. And so there's so much uh, potential represented in Northport. And I think that's going to be uh, recognized and scooped up. Industry sees that opportunity, see that labor force, and they do follow as long as we have sites and the place to put them. And so the city is doing some really great work uh, in that area. So finally, let's talk really quickly about the incentive programs. So Sarasota County does have four different programs that support expanding or new businesses coming in. Um, these are for companies in targeted industries, which means that they're diversifying. 51 plus percent of their product or service is consumed outside of the local market, uh, which means they really have a choice of where to go. So first we have a SMART permit program. Uh, SMART is a, is, a, is a fairly tortured acronym. Sarasota means action response team. Uh, really what this does is decreases the time and the complexity of navigating uh, you know, through that process, help to get that permit specialized attention uh, and to get that done as quickly as possible. Uh, we have two different tax mitigation incentives. One is an ad valorem tax exemption, which provides for up to a 10 year, 100% exemption against both real and personal property um, for qualifying projects. The mobility fee, mobility fee mitigation program, uh, similar to impact fees, uh, but that is another fee that we have the ability based on a, the criteria of a project to take a look and lower, if not eliminate, that particular bill that otherwise comes due to the company. And finally, the Economic Development Incentive Program, which is a discretionary grant program that is performance-based, uh, which is three, four, or $5,000 per new job created in Sarasota County um, based on wage tier. So for manufacturing and logistics, that starts at 100% of the wages, which is about 46000 and then for 150% and 200%, you have that four and $5,000 bonus as well. Um, I have provided Mel and Sandra and the team a document that has more details on these programs. So please take a, take a look at your leisure and any questions or anything, please reach out to us. Sorry, I can't be there for Q&A, but send your questions via email. Happy to get back to you. Really appreciate the opportunity to share some of this with you. Uh, enjoy the rest of the summit and thank you for the time. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you to Destin. At this time, we're going to transition. We're going to have a brief testimonial video from Tanner Lewis of Porcelains Unlimited. And after that testimonial, we're going to have a five minute break. Please come back promptly so we can keep up the positive momentum for our great event. At this time, 
We're hearing from Tanner Lewis of Porcelains Unlimited. Hi there, I'm Tanner Lewis with Porcelains Unlimited and we're here in Northport. Beautiful town, great people, um, love the community. And we actually relocated here about 2012 and very happy here. Um, wonderful uh, atmosphere, great friendly folks that we were ha actually able to build a team with and uh, you know, looking to even grow more. So excited to be here. But here in Northport, I think there's, there's awesome room for growth. Um, you know, the, the availability of not only a workforce, but the, the land development and things like that, that we can grow into bigger, um, more into manufacturing at some point. We would like to expand the manufacturing here, uh, knowing there's great incentives as well. We're actually a memorial company. Uh, we started out in the ceramics and uh, porcelain manufacturing to distribute for headstones, uh, using monuments, cemeteries, funeral homes, and even urn production. So what we do is we manufacture these ceramic pictures uh, that we can place onto a headstone. And within that headstone, we can actually attach a sensor for an automated or a interactive memorial, if you will. By holding your phone near it, you can have not only a picture, a beautiful ceramic picture on a memorial, a very warm picture um, that could be on a cold stone perhaps. And uh, we can actually give that interactive experience to provide pictures, videos, uh, and that interactive through the smartphone. Um, what we loved about Northport, my wife and I relocated here. We felt the family presence here about you know having raising some you know two young boys that we have a three and one year old and uh, you know they're they're just a handful. But we love the environment. You know the parks here are wonderful, uh, the community we feel safe here, um, and everything here else that we feel uh, great about Northport is why we relocated here from the East Coast. Thank you, Tanner. We're going to have a five-minute break. During that five-minute break, if you have not yet put your business card into the drawing, we'll get going. Thank you. Of course. Wow, it's all going good. Wow. You guys are geniuses. You're the rock star. Thank you. Oh, this. I'm going to have a better piece of paper. A brown cover. Okay. It is, it is, but I don't know if anybody can hear it. I don't know if he knows that he's got music. Um, maybe, maybe John. Uh, yeah, no. it's it's. I got up, John. Oh, it's got all these. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Five minutes, we meant five minutes. We started on time, we're going to end on time, and we're going to have a good time. <laughs> At this time, we're going to have the raffle of a, a wonderful uh, computer bag with Northport goodies. And Caitlin, could you do the honors? Caitlin is pulling the recipient of our raffle prize from the city of Northport. And the winner of our raffle is Lee Ann Chung no, no. with Ivy she Ventures. Always, she always wins. <laughs> Lee Ann Chung, where are you? Must be present to win. She's, together, she's not in here. She's here, but she's not in here. So is that is that a guarantee? <laughs> Beautiful. She'll she'll be back. We'll, All right, we'll she'll be warm. back. We so like when her. she comes in, you can let her know that she was our raffle prize winner, and we'll go ahead and make sure that she gets that goodie bag. At this time, we're going to transition to, into another testimonial video. This time, it's going to be Whitney Zora Settler with Coco Yoga Cafe. Hi, my name is Whitney Zora Stetler and I'm the founder of Coco Yoga Cafe, opening in Northport, Florida, summer 2021. It's a yoga studio, but also has a cafe. We'll have a juice bar, fresh pressed juices, smoothies, coffee, tea, bites to eat, nice meeting place. But we're also going to have live music, so it's going to offer Northport something of an event, um, something fun to do that is on a wellness side. And it's exciting to see in Northport the support that small businesses have, even B2B, business to business. Um, right away, I joined the Chamber of Commerce and I've been blown away by the level of support and camaraderie that the Chamber offers and that all the other businesses offer. It's incredible. So my husband and I moved here. We have two small children, seven and three. And that's the thing that is most exciting. I, I like the business side, clearly, but it's so nice to raise my family here. I'm not stuck in traffic jams. I'm not driving an hour to get where I'm going and my kids in the back seat crying. The schools are really good. Teachers really care about the students. There's a lot of love, a lot of communication. Her homework's great. It's close proximity to one of the top rated schools in the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much to Whitney for that wonderful testimony. This time we're transitioning into our panel discussion, and that will be moderated by wonderful Mel Thomas. Please join me in welcoming Mel Thomas back to the lectern. And there's more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, quickly, I want to point out that Ruth Buchanan has joined us, my predecessor. <laughs> She's, she came all the way, well, uh, you know, she's from Manatee County these days, or in Manatee County, so we're glad to have her. And um, Okay, so with us now and at the front of the room, you will be hearing from the following people. Um, so I'm going to kind of run through the list here. I've got um, Monica Bramble, who's our, are you interim now downstairs? In, interim? And, but, and however, she is representing Public Works because that's where she's been um, most recently for a long time, right? Many years. Uh, next to her, we have Mike Vullo, uh, uh, who's Interim Utilities Director for the city. Next, we have uh, Sherry Willette Rondon, who is in our planning division, and she's our zoning coordinator. Gay Sherry. She's got all the answers all the time. Um, she's our go-to pretty much <laughs> all the time. And then next to her, we have Chief Scott Titus, um, who's going to be talking to you about a variety of things. But we, we know that doing business in Northport um, uh, requires a lot of places and a lot of people. It's, it's not difficult to navigate if you know where to go and who to call. And so we thought we would help you understand that process a little better. And that's what this group is here to do. So, Monica, I believe you're first up. 
So if you would right. talk about what, is that what we're doing or we're going to go, okay. All right. I wanted to make sure I was doing them in the proper order. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going we're gonna to try to find out what it is you do in public works and how you interact with business and industry and other residential clients. All right. So public works, um, how we interact and touch you guys mainly is on the transportation side, the stormwater side, and the solid waste side. So um, when you uh, have new development in the city of Northport or you're an existing business, uh, when you go through your permitting and development process, our folks in transportation and stormwater will be assisting you on your site plans, looking at them, working with you to make sure all the codes are um, adhered to, again, uh, for the transportation and the stormwater side. Our solid waste side will also help you look um, at where you're going to place your solid waste containers and assist you on that end. So we really, um, at the front end of your process, we're there uh, in the assisting modes. And then if you are an existing build, uh, facility, a business, if you have any changes that you need to your building your facility, again, we would, on the transportation and stormwater side, be there to assist you. Now, once you're established or you're ready to open up and, and uh, accept customers or business, our solid waste side, what you need to do is you need to contact them first because Y'all will be generating some sort of solid waste, even if you are wonderful in the zero waste, you're going to have some recycling or some resources that will need to go somewhere else. And you want to do that before you open the doors, that needs to be all set. So you'll contact our customer service and you'll um, uh, meet with our uh, uh, commercial solid waste um, staff and they'll help you decide what type of service you need, at what level, you'll sign a service contract, and then you'll be serviced um, at least once a week. That is a requirement in the city of Northport that you do have service at least once a week. You can have it more often than that. But they will um, set up a service agreement with you and then start that um, helping you uh, with your solid waste. So any of our help and assistance for Public Works, you can reach us at our customer service line, which is 240-8050. So if you have any questions on transportation, stormwater, solid waste, that's the number to call, and we will get you to the right person and get assistance for you. I might add that in your um, brochure, we have added all the email addresses you could ever want. They're all the information um, emails, too. So in addition to phone numbers, please feel free to use those email addresses to contact any of these folks up front. Um, I think next in line, we've got Mike. So Mike, well, um, um, Mike is going to be talking to you about utilities in general, I believe, right? Yes. Thank you. Um, so utilities provides the potable drinking water reclaim and central wastewater services throughout the city. Um, currently, we have a 4.4 million gallon uh, a day plant uh, for water treatment and a 7 million gallon a day wastewater treatment plant. Um, on the water storage side, uh, we have 7 million gallons of storage and storage tanks. Uh, we, we just uh, took over and are operating now a, another 2 million gallon storage tank and wastewater treatment plant in the West Villages area. And in the next coming year, we will be starting a 1 million gallon water treatment plant on the initial startup of that, which is expandable as well. Um, so any of the water, wastewater, reclaim services, um, I just want to, we do have uh, flyers in the back with contact information for everybody. I do have the assistant utility director and our engineering manager available in the back who are uh, very good, very knowledgeable, uh, especially uh, Jen DeRosier, our, uh, she's our finance guru and she knows all the ins and outs of that. So contract wise, that will be your contact for utilities. Um, anything with businesses, setting up water availabilities, developer agreements will be through Michelle Tipp. Um, her phone number is 240-8007. Um, she gets kind of the ball rolling. She's our business manager, and we'll start there. Uh, then, it, then it goes to our 
engineering team and specifically with our uh, construction supervisor, which is Daryl Smith. Uh, Daryl Smith is going to go out and calculate capacity fees. He's going to he's going to do your fixture count and get a best uh, estimated uh, ERC. And as we go through the process, we will finalize that um, with the fixture count and. He also sets up any new construction. Uh, we have hydrant meters, uh, construction meters for temporary during construction that we will um, set up and, and help the construction process along to get, get anything uh, developed. And um, Daryl Smith will be in contact with that. And the engineering has a very strong team that assists in all new construction. Um, and then we have our billing at the end, which our billing customer care, um, that's our main number is 429-7122. And this is going to set up any billing questions, frequency, um, as far as duplicate billing, um, e-billing, online payments. Um, we just, um, we work with very well with uh, our commercial and businesses. And we're here to help in any way. So all you need to do is reach out, talk to us. Um, we're willing to sit down. My email address I know is on the flyer there. So if anybody needs anything, just let me know. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm next. I'm here to talk. I represent the planning division. So a lot of the new businesses start uh, with our department, specifically zoning what type of business can go in what area. Um, you usually start um, with a pre-application conference and that is with our staff development review team. A lot of the people that you see here are representative, represented. Um, what typically happens uh, with that, we do it through Microsoft Teams because with the age of COVID, um, we've learned to think on our feet. Uh, each of the departments review the, the proposed site plan or commercial development that is coming into the city. Part of what I do is making sure if it's an old project back um, in 2006, to do some research to see the background, you know, what uh, development orders, if any, are still in existence, et cetera, and kind of a little bit of the background. Then each of the departments, they each give a brief overview of the project. So this is the perfect time for any new business that is coming to the city because it is the time for the dialogue and letting you know if there's any potential problems, what are the solutions that we can do so that it, it's a smooth process from the beginning. So after the um, uh, pre-application meeting with the staff, it comes with a formal submittal. So hopefully, ideally, that at that formal submittal, when they do receive their comments from the pre-application meeting, the developer or the new business, when they come in, it makes a smooth process. So that way, we try to eliminate as many resubmittals as possible so that they could get their development order and then move on uh, to the building permit process. So it basically starts from beginning to end to planning till it's handed off to the building division. Um, also, before when the final plans are submitted, I know I wanted to touch a little bit on the impact fees. They are, we do provide an estimate of the impact fees for the commercial business based on the use. And that estimate is, is good with the final plans. So when the um, project goes through the building permit stage, they know that it would mirror the impact fees, you know, what the cost is. It's to avoid sticker shock because usually before we waiting towards the end of the project, when people want to develop a business, you know, time is money and the cost of what you need to do. So we try to take that into consideration. Um, the next step after a development order is issued, um, we do a pre-construction meeting. And that pre-construction meeting is making sure that all of the items are taken care of, um, any gopher, tortoise issues, environmental components for finalized plans and making sure. So how does it happen? It's, planning is like a hub, if you will, and we work with fire rescue, we work with public works, police, all of the other departments and utilities to make a good project. So I have a few uh, seconds remaining, and um, you know we love the community. It's nice to see some familiar faces in the crowd. I've worked with you before, and we're still here to go forward. We have a lot of growth in our city. Thank you. Excellent. Next up, we have Chief Scott Titus, Fire Department. 
Thank you. I'm honored to be here with you all today, and I'm not sure I've ever said anything in four and a half minutes, so I'm going to do my best. Um, <laughs> I know some of you all in the room, uh, most of you all will have the opportunity to interact with us at two different levels. Um, one of those would be on the prevention side, and one of those would be on the emergency response side. So on the prevention side of things, um, our, our prevention bureau does two things. They do plans review, they do go out and do inspections, annual inspections, um, and they also provide public education. Their job is to put the emergency services side out of business. Um, they try really hard, they do very well. Uh, when you all go through the process, the SDR process, like Ms. Willett was talking about, um, you will interact with our fire marshal. Uh, they try and give you as much information as they can up front if you have questions on what, what the code is. Uh, anytime there's a change of occupancy, uh, new construction, any new business, um, or remodel, uh, you'll be interacting with, with our fire marshal or his personnel on plans review and what requirements are for that. And I would ask you all to keep in mind, sometimes those things are difficult. Sometimes those things cost money. Um, the ultimate goal of that is to make sure that our community is safe, so that the people that you all are serving in your businesses, when they come in, that they're safe. And the other side of that is, is that if there were to be an emergency, or there were to be fire conditions, that our emergency responders are as safe as they can be when they go to mitigate that emergency. Um, so that's the other side of it. Uh, on the emergency services side, we are an ISO 1 rated fire department. Um, what does that mean to you for the community? Uh, if your insurance company uses the ISO rating standard, it means that they're saying we're the best fire protection that you can have, um, which helps with your insurance rates and things like that. So that has a lot to do with how we're dispatched, how we train, how we are staffed, and how we respond to emergencies. So there's a whole lot that goes into that. Um, and they work very hard, and I will tell you, we're not an ISO 1 rated community because of any one person, and certainly not because of me. That's because of the personnel that we have. They put the time in, the work in, and they have the support of this community and our commission, um, and the wisdom to look at those things and see the value in that. So we're very, very appreciative of that. Uh, also on the emergency medical response side of things, um, you know, thankfully we only touch about 5% of the public every year, and some of those are re repeat calls um, for fire and emergency response. So it's very, very important for us to be able to, when we have interactions with you all, um, to stick to our mission. And our mission is to provide exceptional public safety services in a safe, compassionate, professional manner. And there are key words in that very specifically. So any interaction you have with us, whether it's on the prevention side, whether it's on the planning side, or whether it's on the emergency response side, you should expect exceptional service, you should expect safety, you should expect professionalism, and most importantly, compassion, because people will always remember how you made them feel. You all don't know how we're supposed to do our jobs, but you're always going to remember how we make you feel. That's very, very important to us. So your interactions should be good, and if they're not, please let me know. I have a minute left. Um, <laughs> I'll wrap up very quickly. Uh, a couple things I put together today. I have a little handout on uh, the Prevention Bureau, what they do with inspections and some things. You're welcome to have that. If you'd like to have it electronically, please email me and I'd be happy to provide that. I also have a handout. We get a couple of calls a year. A realtor will call me and they want to talk a little bit about closing costs and they understand um, for their, uh, their taxes and their non ad valorem assessments and how that works. And there's a difference between that. So if you remember, taxes are paid in arrears. They're from January 1st to December 31st. And assessments, you know, just to make it more difficult when you make that transaction, assessments are from October 1st to September um, 30th, and uh, they're painted in advance. So when you all do those calculations, it's difficult. I do have a sample on here of how that's configured sometimes. If you haven't done it before, if you're a new realtor or you're trying to put that together, um, we have some examples you work on. But ultimately, it comes down to the buyer and seller. They can make agreements uh, on how that works. So anything we can do to help you, thank you, and have a wonderful day. Excellent. So do we have any questions, uh, either online or in the audience? That boy, boy, that's amazing. Usually you guys get tons of stuff. I do want to add one thing, and that's when in doubt, start with economic development, because we can make sure you get to the right place, to the right people, in the right amount of time. And so we're here to serve, and we, we, we can run some interference for you to get to the right place so you're not being you know, caught up in an odd bureaucratic moment. So, uh, uh, I, I did have a question. One did come in, uh, Chief, and um, basically it's about who does your hair these days? Um. <laughs> and why does it look that way? Because we're dying to know. You really? really gonna get no, we really okay, are so. asking. <laughs> we really are asking. This is a serious question. 
So. Well, I'm, I'm blessed to have been here with the city for uh, going on 27 years this summer. And um, most everybody who has known me since I've been here, my very early years, um, I had a little bit longer hair when I was online as a firefighter. And as I moved through administration, my hair was always very closely cropped and cut. I have a 17 year old who's a senior in high school right now who's uh, wearing a new mullet in the style these days, as you can see. And uh, his hair got curly. And my wife said, Oh, you got your curls for me. And I said, No, he got his curls for me. And she thought that wasn't true. So as the statement goes, I said, Here, hold my drink. And I grew my hair. And so it's kind of been actually, I grew it in. My wife really likes it. So I kept it. So hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully nobody's offended by that. I assure you that it does not detract from my professionalism at all. And, uh, <laughs> we, we understand. Moment of light humor for you. There you go. We, we also understand some of that might be happening in the fire department. Is that true? So other people are emulating your style? Yes, and actually, if you look back on the city's Facebook page, uh, the last time we did an ability test for our new hires, um, some of the police officers were actually making fun of one of our guys who had a, a very... Uh, severe bullet, you could say, and uh, they were across the parking lot talking about where he might be from. And so I called him over, and what they didn't know is he was holding a coffee cup that said, um, firefighters, because even cops need heroes. And I said, hey, do you guys want a picture with him? And they're like, yeah, because they think they're making fun of him. So I took the picture, <laughs> we blew it up, and so it's our firefighter standing between two police officers and with that mug that says it, and we made sure to put it on the city's webpage. So uh, we got the last word on that. <laughs> Good job. Thank you guys for being with us. We really appreciate your taking time out of your day. Thanks Thank so you. much. Thank you. At this time, we're going to have another wonderful testimonial, and Sandra is going to do the honors with technology. Ashley Bloom with SVN Lotus. Hi, this is Ashley Bloom. I'm the managing director of SVN Lotus. And I'm proud to say that I have worked in the city of Northport as an owner, investor, and commercial real estate broker since 2004. I find it a wonderful environment, not only for people to live, but also to work with in the development of commercial property. Uh, the combination of a great economic development, planning, and commission has really made uh, the planning and growth of the city fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashley. This time it's time to introduce another wonderful member of our economic development group, and that's Sandra Goffey, and she will be giving an overview of neighborhood commercial. The reality is the economic development office is rich with talent. You have Mel, you've got Sandra, you've got Caitlin, you've got Kirsten, and you have Destiny. So really appreciative and Looking forward to Sandra's presentation. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Marianne. It's great to be here. I'm here to talk to you a bit about neighborhood commercial. As you know, we have activity centers, which in some areas are known as major employment centers. We call them activity centers. We have several throughout the city, and we are transitioning from just going by number, which is very bland, to giving them real names. So you will hear us sometimes refer to Panacea, Midway, The Springs, um, and there are several others, Yorkshire. But uh, today we're going to talk about neighborhood commercial. And those are the smaller parts of um, neighborhoods. Very clever how we named them that. Neighborhood commercial locations are 21 of them throughout the city, and they are the rather purplish blobs that you see, the little squares, they're between five, 10 acres, designed to provide those kinds of services that we all need in our neighborhood. We want more uh, convenient places for us to shop or take our kids for daycare, that kind of thing. Uh, and these need to be the kind of places that look great, are safe, um, fit in with the look and feel of your neighborhood. And we want to encourage you as professionals in the commercial real estate industry to think about how you can bring some of your clients here to build some beautiful uh, places that make those neighborhoods neighborhoods. And that's uh, something we want to encourage you that we have this. It's um, We want to get that on your radar. Our uh, Fabulous Commission challenged us to do this, and of course we were up for it. We have identified these places and as well as their um, 
the research that we did to come up with uh, the owners, and we are working very strategically at reaching out to them. And we will continue to do that. You know, we've identified if they have water and sewer, what is going to be needed. Um, we said that we we're going to do do this to encourage creativity. So your challenge today is to be creative and think about how you can bring these areas um, to life with the kinds of services that we want. Because what we're thinking is, if um, if we don't help you, if we just let it sit and wait for something to come along, we won't get the kinds of places we want. So this is our first step in reaching out and saying, think about how you can bring something to a, a neighborhood that is, is helpful and makes it the kind of place that people want to live. Uh, as I'd like to say, we want to think big so we can think small. So think big about how to grow some, some of these smaller commercial areas. Uh, dog groomers are great. Florists, daycare. We are a young city. We need more daycare. And it's great if it's closer to the homes. Uh, we want to think artsy, too. We would love to have an artistic community, maybe something like a village of the arts. Maybe that means um, redeveloping an area or coming up with something that has that sense of creativity that brings a real vibe. Uh, we also, um, you know, music stores would be great. Small shops. We uh, were brainstorming in the department, and thank goodness we have our, our younger contingency here. They said, how about boba tea? And Mel and I said, what the heck is boba tea? <laughs> and, uh, we're, we're excited to find out that this is a really cool place to hang out, that these younger people can, uh, well, uh, not all of them are that young, but love to go to these places. And it's a, a nice environment for uh, having drinks. You play uh, board games, too, just a hangout, what we used to do at a, at a coffee shop. We got a, an email late last night from someone who wants to develop a drive through coffee shop somewhere in Northport. Love to have that. We would love we love our Los Dos Cristianos. They were our coffee provider today. Uh, great to have those local, local grown kinds of places. And that's what we're, we're here to do. We have these great, um, uh, a great map that Kirsten Peterson has been developing that can help you do the research now. Uh, something that we were lacking a bit is somebody who's really good at research. And Kirsten can do that for you. She's hiding in the back. But she is awesome at that kind of thing to help you find the, the assets that you need to bring it all together. So we want to encourage you, think large in order to grow some of these smaller businesses that we need to make a neighborhood a neighborhood. And that, that's what I have to say about that. And I, now, um, in just a second, we're going to hear from somebody who can uh, help make all of that happen. Let's give Sandra a hand. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and we have our next testimonial from Tony Gostitis. Please enjoy this testimony. And you're here, Tony, in he person. Here in person. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm dancing as I change between. Uh, so thank you for your patience. And well done, technology. We have, yeah. um, who's in the background uh, doing all this? Jonathan, it, uh, the awesome Jonathan Let's Hall. Jonathan. Is, he is, uh, yes. Juggling in, in person, online, and Sandra over there. Are you ready to oh, press the I'm, button? I'm ready. I'm pressing the button right now. Here okay, we go. Okay, Tony. Hang on. Hi, I'm Tony Gostaitis. I'm with the Rhonda Gostaitis Real Estate Team in uh, Keller Williams Peace River Partners. I've been living in town a little over 28 years now. And uh, to see what the commercial real estate industry has been doing now, it's just amazing. It's incredible. It's growing and thriving. With the access to I-75 and the U.S. 41 corridors are here and so much land, it is just a, a place to bring your business down here or start one up. With the population growing so fast, uh, Sarasota County increased by 20% and that's all coming from Northport. It's a great place to, to live with affordable housing and uh, people are coming down here because they love it. Bring your business down here with this beautiful sunshine, there's plenty of land, 
we're close to the beaches, we're near major cities, we got the best of both worlds, the small town, hometown feeling. But to the north of us, we got Tampa and Orlando. To the south, we have Naples and we have Miami, and we're in the middle. We have professional teams here for sports, football, baseball, hockey. We got our own Atlanta Braves for spring training right here in town. So come on down here, start your business. This is the place to be. This is so exciting for me because I get to introduce my friend and colleague, Ron Starner. Um, for those of you who don't know him, oh my gosh, just wait till you have some time to talk to him because he is just, he's just so engaging and wonderful and he really understands his business. Um, what I love about Ron is that we both are kind of living in the Atlanta, I'm from Atlanta, Ron is in Atlanta. Um, we, we share a love of the Braves, which is an amazing thing, because it concentrates itself right here in Northport. And um, so I, I met Ron some time ago, some long time ago, and I believe we were trying to figure out if this is his third time here to the summit. I think it, it's either the third or the fourth. Um, but Ron also comes and brings his family to vacation here. He loves it so much that, um, you know, I think he should just move here permanently. It would be actually a very good thing for all of us if he did. But um, I, I just can't, I really cannot thank him enough. He does this on his own dime. And he, that's how much he loves this. I just, and he sees such possibility and promise in Northport. So he's going to share that with you, I think, along with a whole lot of other things um, that will come from his background in site selection. So Ron is Executive Vice President of Conway Incorporated and Site Selection Magazine, which is an international corporate real estate publication which is based in Atlanta. Site Selection reaches 45,000 high-level decision makers six times a year with timely news, analysis, and perspectives on key events and trends in corporate real estate and economic development. The magazine also publishes SiteSelection.com, which is an online web portal for corporate real estate economic development news and data and five email newsletters at any time. So, you know, if you're smart, you'll go online and figure it out. Ron has, Ron has also served nine years as executive director for IAMC, which is a corporate real estate and economic development association. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say he is here for a week. He's brought his family. We plan to get together and get old friends together and talk about all kinds of wonderful things. But I'm here to say, welcome, Ron. Please come to the podium. <laughs> COVID-19 changed our world and the way we live in it in ways that we are only beginning to understand. This became painfully clear to me a few days ago as, I, as it dawned upon me that I had planned a family vacation around a gas shortage, <laughs> a, a rental car shortage, and a rental housing shortage. Optimal time to take a beach <laughs> vacation, right? and to drive from Atlanta to Northport. Well, we survived that ordeal, and we're here. Got, you figured it out, got through it, but those are just, that's just uh, small potatoes, right? I mean, those are what the quintessential description of first world problems. And what I'm gonna share with you are ways that COVID-19 changed the way companies go about evaluating where they're gonna locate. But I do, feel like before I get into that, we should just stop and reflect on the real cost of COVID-19, which was on human life, our health, our safety, our ability to get together with our loved ones. And just today, I, I looked on the CDC's website, the total U.S. cases of COVID-19 as of today is 33.1 million. That's one out of every 10 Americans which means that in a gathering this size, many of you have suffered from COVID-19, perhaps some quite severely. Uh, I've lost very dear friends due to COVID. The 
chief financial officer of our company, spent five days in the hospital fighting for her life. And I'm pleased to say that she's here among us today. But so I, I don't want to minimize the impact that COVID has had. As of today, more than 588,000 Americans have passed away due to COVID. That's well over half a million, and that number continues to rise. So whatever we talk about today, and these are important issues that we're going to discuss, they're not nearly as important as what has happened to us, to our families, to our loved ones, and our ability to get together with them. But there is, a, there is an impact uh, on jobs and industry and their movement. So the three things that I want you to learn more than anything else today are these. How COVID-19 changed the way companies evaluate their facility location decisions. Number two, what site selectors must find in your community before they will even talk to you. And then perhaps most importantly, number three, how to get your message in front of the right people. That is how to get capture the attention of site selectors and corporate executives so that you can move the needle positively in your direction. And unless you think that's a minor point, let me, let me, let me correct that. Because typically we would think that people that work at Site Selection Magazine are fairly intelligent, fairly well geographically literate. Oh, no. When I did a survey before the last time, Mel, you know this, before I spoke here two years ago, I just did a random survey of the office of about a dozen people. And I asked them, just point blank, you cannot Google this or use Alexa, where is Northport? You would not believe the answers that I got. First of all, most people didn't even know it was in Florida. And the, I think, three or four people who did know it was in Florida were way off the map. One person said, I think I remember seeing that on the east coast of Florida somewhere. Um, somebody else thought, well, it's certainly in the northern part of the state, right? Uh, some, uh, the most bizarre answer I got, though, was someone literally thought it was in Key West. <laughs> so, I'm still trying to figure out that answer. Uh, so, one of two things had to be true. Either I've hired the dumbest people on the planet, or Northport has a problem. And I think it's the latter. Okay? So, now, thanks to the Braves... That has changed dramatically. As Mella said, we share this affinity for cheering on the Atlanta Braves, who did quite well last year. Thank you. Probably due to our support, I think. <laughs> but they, um, since the Braves moved to Northport, as I can tell, I can attest as someone who listens to sports talk radio way too much on a daily basis in Metro Atlanta. The name Northport comes up scores of times a day, especially now while the Braves are playing. I mean, you really can't even go a full hour listening to a radio broadcast without Northport coming up, including sometimes many times. In fact, the leading sports personality for 20 years on Atlanta Sports Talk Radio, John Kincaid, who just recently went to a station in Philadelphia, he said last year, he said he was such a big fan of the Braves moving to Northport that when he retired, he was going to move himself and his family to Northport so that he could go to all the Braves games. You know, and he, he's saying this on Metro Atlanta radio, the, the, the most listened to radio sports talk in Atlanta. So it wasn't just me that was hearing this, but you know, every Braves fan in Metro Atlanta and beyond was hearing that. So... Kudos to you, the city leaders, all of you, for the foresight, the vision you had to know the impact of spring training baseball that goes beyond just one month a year. It really, really carries on. So let's, let's talk about how corporate site selection changed. So if we look, can we go to the first slide here? And, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'm going to tell you. Right here. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. No problem. This is the biggest one, and you probably didn't even need to be told this, but instead of people chasing jobs 
Jobs are now chasing people. And what do I mean by that? Well, this isn't just a theory that Ron Starner came up with. This is direct feedback from site selection consultants. So all of the data that you're going to hear, at least in the first half of this presentation this morning, are the direct results of a survey we conducted of all of the national site selection consulting firms in America. All right, so this data is, is, is fairly new. Uh, this was, the results of this were published in our January issue. And so again, I'm not telling, I'm, I am telling you this, but I'm not the person that came up with, with these trends. 54% of those consultants said that the trend toward more remote work is having some effect on their clients' site selection decisions, and 29%, so you're getting close to a third, are now saying it's having a significant effect. Only 17%, or just about one out of six, said it is having no effect. Plus, and this is perhaps the most significant of our findings, 68%, that's more than two-thirds of all of the consultants, said that the shift to remote work will continue even after the pandemic subsides. Number two, as jobs chase workers wherever they are located, companies are realizing that they no longer have to remain in large and costly city centers. Boy, this finding here directly plays to your strength. Over half of the consultants told us that their clients are contemplating moving operations out of city centers into suburbs and rural areas. That's Northport, right? It's better to be Northport now than it is to be New York, LA, all the big cities that companies can't get out of fast enough for a host of reasons. Almost 40% said they expect their clients to stay in about the same real estate mix that they are, and 10% said they would consider consolidating into city centers, and those are mainly people that are gonna close a bunch of offices and just have a hub that very few people commute to. Number three, the most attractive locations got even more attractive in 2020. So the site consultants said that these states have done the most to improve their business climate in recent years. Texas, North Carolina, Florida, and Virginia. So this is really encouraging, particularly at a time when Florida eliminated the QTI tax incentive. That was huge for site consultants. Um, and I'm not sure that we've seen the full effect of that play out yet, but at least for now, you know, the consultants are saying that that Florida is still very, very attractive. 41% of the consultants said that the Southeast has done the most to improve its business climate, but look at this, the Midwest is gaining steam. 36% said the Midwest had done the most to improve. No other region of the U.S. topped 7.7%. So really it's a race between states like Florida, Georgia, and the Carolinas and Tennessee versus places like um, Ohio, Indiana, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Michigan. Not so much Illinois, and we'll get to that later. Number four, reshoring became a top priority in 2020. 41% said their clients are considering more reshoring projects. 51% said their clients are staying about the same and 8% said they're considering new international locations. Does anyone have any reason why these findings are the way they are? What, what, would, you, what would your theory be on the reshoring uh, epidemic? Any thoughts? Certainly somebody has an idea. Don't be bashful. So, so in other words, take, uh, instead of relying upon plants overseas, bringing those manufacturing operations back to this country. Now, literally closing a plant in China and, and moving that production operation to somewhere in the States. Ta-da, there it is. The magic words. And, and, and I'm sorry, who are you? Okay, Barbara. I like Barbara a lot. Okay, yeah, I do. Supply, it's all about supply chain. Just look at the supply chain disruptions we're all experiencing right now. 
Um, after living in Beaufort, Georgia for 20 years, I sold my home there. Good time to sell, right? Sucks to be a buyer, though, right? You don't want to be a buyer. That's why people aren't selling their homes. Just, they would, wait, then i got to buy something. So you, you can't, it doesn't work, the math doesn't work. Well, it did back in September. And um, so I sold my home, and I moved from Beaufort to Alpharetta. Is anyone here familiar with, besides Mel, with Metro Atlanta geography? Okay, good. You know where Beaufort and Alpharetta are? Oh, coming. Okay. That was, you would have practically been my neighbor. Well, anyway, the headquarters of Conway Data is in Peachtree Corners in the far southern end of Gwinnett County. Beaufort is about as far north as you can go. So it was an hour drive each way every day. And I got really, really tired of that. And so I used the opportunity of the pandemic to sell my house and relocate to a place much closer to work which I still needed to go into at least occasionally. Now I'm going in every day. And I went from being 28 miles away to seven miles away. I went from two hours in the car every day to about 20 minutes in the car every day. And when people said, well, what was that like, Ron? I said, I felt like I got two hours of my life back every day. And I'm, I am not the only person doing this. There is, that, that trend is sweeping the country of people getting closer to where they work whether it's working from home or working from the beach or just wanting to be closer to the physical plant that they are still required to go to, the era of the long commuter is over. I mean, it is just dead. So uh, people aren't going to do that anymore. So if you're planning, if you're an employer and you're considering that your employee radius is going to be like an hour or whatever, you need to rethink that. You need to be thinking like 20 minutes in, honestly, because people just aren't, after getting used to the freedom and flexibility uh, and access that they've had to all kinds of amenities, um, they're not going to go back. They're not going to go back to long commuting. But the supply chain is what's driving this. There's a shortage of just about everything. You know, again, I learned this the hard way because when I moved to a new place, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to go, you know, out with the old and then with the new. So I wanted new furniture. I think, well, that's great. I'll just go waltz in. Like, I'd like this sofa and this love seat. You can deliver it on Saturday. And they're like, um, are you, like, aware of what's going on, sir? <laughs> uh, the best we can do is maybe three or four months. I'm, I'm like, what? You're, you're, you're kidding, right? No, no, it's like, it's three or four months, but you'll get it. Well, eight months later, I got it. And I'm not alone. I recently interviewed the chief executive officer of a major furniture company in America. It's a name you would all know. And he told me that that is now the norm. Because when the pandemic hit and everyone started staying home, everyone started investing into new furniture. Everything from setting up a home office to like, man, we've been sitting on this couch here forever. Let's get rid of it. It's just home remodeling projects have swept the country. So anything made out of wood, there's a shortage of. Lumber prices have increased by over 400% in the past 12 months. So this, anything made from wood. So paper, something I know and appreciate, um, we pay a lot to consume paper to print 45,000 magazines six times a year. And that's the single biggest, biggest expense that we have. The paper suppliers have already told us to count on three more significant price increases in 2021. And now we're having paper shortages. We can't all, we've always printed on the same stock. Uh, we, we're not get, we are no longer guaranteed that we can print on our preferred stock. The best they can do sometime, sometimes is an approximate facsimile. So you would probably, if you are a subscriber to the magazine, you probably won't notice the difference, but I do. It's not the paper that we want. And so we just have to get what we get. It's kind of like whatever's left in the plant that's what you're going to get. So there's a paper shortage, there's a pulp shortage, there's a packaging sh shortage. Um, anything that comes from a tree, um, good luck trying to get it, and you're going to pay through the nose to get it. And that's just one of many things, right? There's, there's all kinds of supply chain shortages. That's what's driving reshoring. The first plants to close down in Asia and relocate to America were the pharmaceutical manufacturing operations. Because the first thing that COVID-19 revealed to us 
was that we were desperately dependent upon foreign countries to supply us and our people with life-saving medicine. and We couldn't afford to do that anymore. The U.S. is now in the most advantageous position in the world for COVID-19 vaccinations. You know what one of the countries is that is in one of the worst positions? Germany. I mean, think about that. Germans who are known for their engineering prowess, right? Um, very, I mean, we typically think of them as being a world leader. They didn't plan ahead. They, they did not secure the supplies that they needed. And now they're far less than half of their population has even had their first shot. So, and then once you start getting to third world countries, I mean, the, the numbers are horrific. So, um, so we should all be very extremely grateful that, you know, our government had the foresight to secure the doses. And obviously we're blessed that Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson are all American companies, right? So, you know, it's, it, that was a time where it was just such a tremendous blessing to live here. All right, the fifth major finding, and then we'll move on to, to some other topics, is that a whole new range of deal killers entered the site selection lexicon. So any problem that pre-existed the pandemic was exacerbated by the pandemic. So these deal killers were already uh, being cited by consultants, but these kind of moved to the top of the list. So according to the consultants that we surveyed late last year, these were the four biggest reasons why a deal got scuttled. In other words, every, the, everything else was in place, right? They had a site. They had everything lined up. It made the math worked. Number one, far and away, failure to meet project deadlines. And they're not talking about their contractors and subcontractors and their own internal resources. They're talking about you, right? They're talking about the city, the county, the state, all the utilities, every agency that comes into play that has to get a project done. Secondly, onerous labor management relations. So if, it, if your area is known for a lot of contention between management and labor, that's not going to work for most employers. Thirdly, public opposition to incentives for the project. So you may, be, you may award incentives to a company, but the last thing they want to do is be dragged into a room like this at a public hearing for a standing room only crowd where most of the people are carrying knives and pitchforks, right? <laughs> That's like, that deal is not going to fly because they can't afford the PR hit that that's going to have. And then fourthly, lack of ethics and community leadership. So they basically are telling us, look, we're, our clients are not going to do business with any government agency that even has a whiff of corruption about it or just doesn't have its act together. So what does matter most? Well, again, we surveyed not just the consultants for this one, but the entire readership of Site Selection Magazine. And this is as of November, because we do this survey every October. So in the November 2020 issue of Site Selection, we reported these findings. The, these are the most important location factors that determine whether they're gonna pick you or not. Now, I'm not gonna read this list. Um, uh, this presentation will be made available to everyone that's attending, both online or in person. But the one thing I will point out is that four of these 10 have to do with people, right? Obviously, the first two goes without saying workforce skills and workforce development. What they're really talking about there is access to worker training programs. But number six, are you a, a right to work state? The answer to that is yes for Florida. And then eight, quality of life. And this, Sandra, is why the presentation you just gave is so vitally important. Because I was, I was really encouraged to see that because this is exactly what the workers of today and the future are looking for, are neighborhoods like that, communities like that. Because it's really, now that they can theoretically, many of these degreed millennials and younger will say, can many of them, will be able to choose where they live first 
even before what they do or where they work. And so they're going to look for places like that, quality neighborhoods. You know, places like Avalon and Alpharetta, which you're familiar with, Mel, or, you know, the collection at Forsyth in Cumming, which you're probably familiar with, um, Atlantic Station. Uh, my, uh, my second son, who's on this trip with me, uh, he just bought a house in Decatur because he loves Decatur. I mean, it's just, it's just a phenomenal place to be. So, so, so four of the ten really have to do with people and how you treat them. So what does Northport need to do? Let's turn our attention to this. Well, I know technically you're not a small town, but in the eyes of many employers, right, and, and, and corporate America, so to speak, you, you would be considered a small town. Um, and so these are some of the things that you should focus on. And I've highlighted some that I think probably, uh, in, in my professional opinion, I would say start first, which would be work with your community colleges and high schools to encourage entrepreneurship as an alternate career path. In other words, don't just recruit workers, recruit or develop the people who will create the jobs of the future. And there is a difference between those two. Focus on your niche industries. In other words, play to your strengths. Know what you're good at and really highlight that. And then the other one is recognize the importance that arts and museums play in attracting people and firms. I go back to your presentation, Sandra. This is so important. Any survey done of millennials and younger, so Generation Z, and all right, what are they going to do after Z? They just start over again? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, this is what they're looking for. Again, so they're looking for the community first and the job second. The 20 most dynamic small towns in America. Again, I'm not going to read this list. You'll have this chart available to you. But what jumps, there's two things that jump out at me. Number one is there's only one Florida community on here, and that's Key West. Which Northport went to Key West, right? <laughs> <laughs> According to one of my coworkers, Northport is on this list. <laughs> Good point. Uh, but the other thing that jumps out at me is that 14 of the 20 are in the West. And this is uh, a relatively new phenomenon in terms of economic development the patterns of people migration and corporate migration, which is, it used to be that all the arrows were going from, like, from New York and Illinois and places in between directly south to the southeast. Now it's a westward, the, the westward arrows are just as prevalent as the southward arrows. And they're going to places like Colorado and Idaho. Um, I have a daughter a married daughter, they live in Boise, Idaho, they feel like they've hit the jackpot. They just they they are they are so in love with, with Boise. Um and tech firms agree with them by the way. So Salt Lake City is is really, really hot right now. Anywhere around uh, Metro Phoenix, you know, good luck buying a house there. Um and many other places. Uh these are these are kind of the new places to be. And so it used, this, the South kind of used to, I think, operate like, like if they were playing poker, they just had a lay down hand, and it's really not that easy anymore. You know, we're now increasingly competing against the West. All right, so everybody, this is the most coveted demographic in America, degreed millennials, okay? People like Destiny over here, which I, you're, I guess you're not a millennial because you're younger than... Well, no. Okay. <laughs> but for the sake of my presentation, you're now a degreed millennial. Okay. So, people... Caitlin. Oh, you are. Okay, Caitlin. Okay. The, according to a survey, and this, we didn't conduct this, but I wrote an article about it. These were the seven factors that tended to attract them. Um, you know, one of the things... Uh, you know, affordability is very important. And again, this plays to your strength. You know, just because millennials get hired, you know, get, you know, really good jobs and get, you know, are paid above the norm, um, housing has become so expensive in most major American cities that it's really hard for young people or young families to afford to live there. It could be their first house purchase, right? 
And well, you can't do that in California, right? There's a lot of places, a lot of places in coastal Florida, you can't do that anymore, right? Place that you could drive 30 minutes from here, and you're gonna you're gonna be in neighborhoods where degreed millennials can't afford to live, right? So affordability is huge. And so is access to research one universities that act as talent factories. And I realize while there is not a major research one university based in Northport, you're not that far from them, right? So you're close enough. And a multitude of living options. So three cities bucking the tide of brain drain. I think everyone in this room, including myself, could learn a lot from these three cities, Columbus, Ohio, Des Moines, Iowa, and Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, here's another trivia question. Uh, what do these three cities have in common? <laughs> no. That's it. All right. Marianne got it right. Universities, specifically Big Ten universities. And do you know where most Big Ten graduates go to work after, they, after school? Chicago. Chicago is the number one employer of Big Ten University grads. But not for these three cities. Columbus gets Ohio State grads to stay home. Des Moines gets Iowa and Iowa State and Drake University grads to stay home. And Madison gets who? University of Wisconsin Badgers to stay home. So it would kind of behooves us to find out what are they doing, right? Most communities in the, in the um, Midwest uh, lose their talent, their brightest and their best workers, to Chicago, Nashville, Atlanta, Tampa, Phoenix, San Francisco, New York, and places like that. Why do Columbus, Des Moines, and Madison not? What are they doing? Yes, they have these types of neighborhoods with the amenities that Sandra just talked about. I've spent a lot of time in Columbus, Ohio. No, I, I swear I'm not cheating on Northport. <laughs> but I, but I, I, I love Columbus, okay? I spent a lot of time there. My family is originally from Columbus, so I, do I get a hall pass on Columbus? <laughs> kind of? Okay. All right, so Columbus is my hall pass community. Um, I love it. So they have this district on the north side of downtown called the Short North. Has anyone ever been there? You have? You know what I'm talking about? It's pretty awesome, isn't it? It's really awesome. And it's right, it's directly north, kind of attached to the Arena District. So the Arena District has Nationwide Arena, which is where the Columbus Blue Jackets play. It's got Huntington Ballpark, which is where the AAA team of the New York Yankees, the, Clip, the Columbus Clippers, play. And now, well, there's a, there's a brand new stadium being built for the Columbus crew. So they're going to have Major League Soccer, National Hockey League, and AAA Baseball all in one area. And it's within walking distance of the short north. So you can imagine just what, what that's going to be like not just on game days, but really throughout the year. Imagine the battery in Atlanta around Truist Park multiplied by a factor of three. That's what Columbus has now. So you have the Braves. So again, there's an opportunity here. Des Moines has comparable neighborhoods like that, and so does Madison. One of the largest companies in America, Epic, uh, was created by graduates of the University of Wisconsin they now have over 10,000 employees uh, in Madison. So if you are um, a computer science grad from the University of Wisconsin, you're probably going to go work for Epic, and you're going to you're going to love working there and love living in Madison. <laughs> so how do we get them to come here? This is what you all came to hear, right? Someone's overcredited me with saying, uh, well, we're going to listen to the, to the guy that can get him here. I, I can't do that. I can't make anyone do anything. But I can tell you the strategies that you need to implement. First thing is listen to them. These are direct quotes 
they had opportunities to write in you know extra comments in the survey and these are direct direct quotes from the from the site consultants number one clients will be meaning our clients will be redeploying to tier two and tier three metros that's what you are the northport sarasota bradenton msa falls in a uh, in it's Tier two, or are you tier two or tier three? Okay, probably in the middle. Right? You're tier two point five. So. <laughs> Number two, there will be a consolidated office strategy because of satellite offices being used instead of large corporate locations. I can't tell you what a perfect fit Northport is for a satellite location. Fits perfectly. Number three, companies will grow existing facilities and new facilities in key markets closer to supply chain elements. Here we go back to logistics again. Where is Northport? Exactly in the middle of what? Tampa Bay and Miami, Fort Lauderdale. Right smack dab in the middle. Couldn't be better situated than that. Rule number two, make these four habits a priority. Continue to focus on place and amenities, hence why Sandra spoke. Number two, diversify and broaden your business portfolio so that you have more to offer than just, um, you know, four interchanges for, for warehouses, right? Three, make the permitting process quick and easy, hence the panel and what they had to talk about. And then four, communicate more directly with site selectors. And you may be wondering, wow, that sounds great, on, but how do we do that? Well, there's a number of strategies you can employ, but clearly it requires marketing. You know, anything worth doing is worth doing well, which means you have to invest some resources in it. When Louisiana suffered Hurricane Katrina in August of 2005, how are we doing? Am I, am I about to get the hook, Destiny? He said, no, okay. And then two months later, suffered Hurricane Rita. Uh, it, it was the, the worst natural disaster in, in Louisiana history when you put those two things together. They had a mass exodus of people and companies, right? And the estimate, economists estimated that the marketing challenge facing state of Louisiana to convince people to come back there, to move back to places like Lake Charles, Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Alexandria, and New Orleans would cost about $100 million. It was a $100 million challenge. And, but not, not everyone bought into that, but you know who did? The Lake Charles region, surprisingly enough. So Lake, is anyone familiar with Lake Charles? Have you been there? Okay. So it's uh, the far southwest corner of Louisiana. It probably gets the least attention. Certainly gets much less attention than Baton Rouge and New Orleans. But um, it's a five parish region of Allen, Beauregard, Cameron, Calcasieu, and Jeff Davis parishes. About 300,000 people live in these five parishes. Over the last decade and a half, they've spent millions of dollars on marketing and trade missions and other initiatives to get corporate America, not just corporate America, but the world, to pay attention to them. As of today, there is in excess of $80 billion worth of industrial plant activity occurring in the Lake Charles region. 50 billion already completed, another 30 billion in the pipeline. This wouldn't have happened. This is all post Katrina and Rita. Um, none of this would have happened without the visionary leadership of George Swift. So uh, the Southwest Louisiana Economic Development Alliance has their version of Mel Thomas. He's, he's called George Swift. And he, um, He's just probably the most visionary economic development leader that I've ever encountered. And um, I would say, actually, I would say probably worth a road trip for whoever, maybe the, maybe the entire city commission, just to go out there to Lake Charles, spend a day with George, and then come back and bring home his best practices. 
That's probably the best tip I can give you today. And with that, I'll shut up and listen. So thank you. Do we have any follow-up questions for Ron? It's always so informative and insightful and visionary. So we very much appreciate you. your willingness to come and speak to, and sure. be a keynote speaker. Thank you again, Ron. Thank you. Thank you. As we wind things up, we'd like to invite Jason up to the podium. Jason Yarber is your interim city manager. And I again want to thank our planning committee, our volunteers, Debbie Snowden and Bruce Hen Henry, along with everyone for the economic office. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to say thank you for honoring us with your presence today. Um, our expert uh, speakers today have underscored the varying ways that this is a great time um, for a great investment in one of the fastest growing cities in the United States, the eighth fastest uh, to be exact. Land availability, location, accessibility, workforce, quality of life. Um, these are the factors that make Northport a logical choice. Uh, for the future, for your future. And we hope that you will think of Northport when you decide to buy, build, or develop, or expand. We hope you'll think of Northport first. And again, thank you so much for your time. And uh, safe travels. And see you next year for the sixth annual <laughs> summit. Thank you very much. Are we good or what? Well, good. 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 Good.